November 2nd, 2020, Select this Board. This meeting is being recorded. Select Board meeting. Uh, we will get underway with our agenda right away and invite Chief Mike Cassidy up for the coronavirus community update. Chief, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you? I am quite well, thank you. We are in good company. There are 120 other communities in the Commonwealth that share the same risk designation that we do, so we are trailblazers. We, we set that uh, standard many weeks before several of them joined last week. Uh, currently, we have 152 total diagnoses since this began back in March. 119 have recovered. There have been two COVID-related fatalities, which leaves us with 31 active cases right now. Those 31 cases are spanning 21 single-family homes. There are four homes with two cases, and there are two homes with four cases. So we continue to see household spread in our community. And consistent with other communities around the Commonwealth, uh, the, the smaller social gatherings, as well as sports activities, continue to be uh, the nexus of several of the clusters. There is still no evidence of spread within schools, both in Holliston as well as throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and to ensure that we continue not to bring uh, the virus into the schools uh, in conversation with the Board of Health. I sh should clarify that with the health director uh, <coughs> and officials from the school department. We uh, anticipate that the schools will send home some additional guidance clarifying when students should be kept home, specifically if there is a member of the family whose testing is pending because someone is symptomatic or if a student is a close contact of a confirmed or suspected case of coronavirus. Uh, that will hopefully help keep uh, students from being close contact with someone who may be an asymptomatic carrier. Um, I'd like to express my thanks to everyone from the community who participated in lower risk activities on Halloween. Um, and also last Wednesday, we did send out our Blackboard notice to over 10,000 recipients. If a resident did not get an email or did not get a phone call or did not get a text message or wishes to have their pager added to the distribution list, they can reach out. The uh, button appears on the town's website, on the fire department's website, on the police department's website. Uh, you can <coughs> sign up and get as many different types of notification as you would like. Uh, we enhanced our weekly report, which was published uh, on Thursday evening, once the state published their weekly report. Um, and then there were some changes that the governor issued today, executive orders that go into effect <coughs> Friday morning just after midnight. Uh, most of them do not impact us directly, uh, but things like indoor gathering size reduced for uh, private gatherings, reduced to 10 persons, Outdoor private gatherings reduced to 25 persons, and a lot of things will be closing down at 9.30 um, for a stay-at-home advisory from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m., which goes into effect on Friday morning. Uh, obviously, we've got the elections tomorrow. We are uh, prepared as we have figured out what to do back in May as well as in September with regards to the distancing, with regards to the hand sanitizing, uh, the stations are well apart. Uh, the town clerk and her crew have uh, mm -hmm. taken all the mitigation steps necessary. We've got directional travel, um, and I'm very confident that everyone who wishes <coughs> to vote in person tomorrow that has not voted already uh, can do so. Again, as we mentioned last week, if you arrive and there appears to be a long line out the door, it's probably not a long like line as we've had in previous years. It's probably a line that has six foot spacing between individuals waiting to go into the building. Um, and then uh, once we get through the elections, obviously we want to continue to be thinking about our plans for town meeting on uh, Saturday, December 5th. And I know we have talked before about uh, what steps we would want to take to make sure that everyone is safe, and I'm prepared to uh, talk about that as well. Great. Should you have any questions? Very good. Let's start with questions from my peers. Uh, ben? Well, you answered a couple of them already, but I do wanted, I, I did want to ask you, that's a great segue, which you just gave me, set up. 
Um, does anything in the executive order from the governor, would that impact uh, town meeting? Um, it would it, not. It would uh, not, okay. Uh, one of the exclusions are for legislative bodies. So we are not uh, bound <coughs> by either the gathering size restriction or if <laughs> for some reason we needed to go after 930 um, as special town meeting, <laughs> uh, because it is our legislative body that is meeting, it is an exclusion to the executive order. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. From Tina. 1 p.m. to 930. <laughs> Let's hope. We're not in that Cross situation. our fingers. A uh, couple questions. So last week you reported 21 active <laughs> cases. Today we are 31 active cases. That is correct. Uh, can you report, if, if at all, uh, how many of those 31 active cases are hospitalized? Is that something you are privy to or can report on if you uh, have that information? I do not have that information. I am not aware of any of our current cases being hospitalized. So they're all, to your knowledge, they're quarantined at home? They are isolating at home. That is okay. correct. All right. Um, and then in terms of enforcement with the governor's new advisory today, um, 9.30 p.m., meals no longer being served, people advised to be at home, 10 p.m. on f forward. The governor spoke about enforcement. Yes. He definitely, as he has before, kept it to the local level. That is correct. Um, what votes or decisions do we have in place today, if any, to support the police or the Board of Health stepping into a situation where um, we're not following the governor's advisory statement. No additional votes are required. Okay. Uh, DPH legal indicated that because it's an executive order that was promulgated by the governor, uh, the local boards of health as well as local police and state police are empowered to enforce those uh, guidelines. So what would happen is if the police were to disperse a crowd because they were in excess of the gathering size, uh, then with a report from the police officer that was involved in dispersing that crowd, uh, the local board of health could issue a fine to the host okay. uh, as under a nuisance order, okay. which, which exists in their, uh, their statutory authority to, as a baseline. Does that fine come with, the th is it a $300 fine? or the Three or 500 depending on which is being violated. Okay. And they actually were quite <laughs> specific. Uh, they've beeped, uh, beefed up the fines for exceeding the gathering size limit. Okay. So it used to be that if you violated the gathering size, it was 500. If you violated the mask order, it was 500. And if you violated the distancing, it was 500. So potentially you could look at a $1,500 fine for one incident. Okay. What they've done, as the governor is really trying to encourage people not to have gatherings, is that for each person over the limit, it would be a separate fine. So if you were not supposed to have more than 10 people in a <coughs> private residence at a gathering, and there were 15 people, it would be five times 500. Okay. And if it were a, uh, a public venue and it were uh, a say a, a reception that had been scheduled beforehand and now they didn't cut their list, uh, then it could be substantial fines. And then the 10 p.m., everybody home? The 10 p.m., uh, the way the governor explained it, it is that his desire is that this would be an educational opportunity. Okay. Uh, and that if there are repeat infractions, then you could go the, the route of the fines. But the okay. first time that uh, the locals need to disperse folks after hours, it would be, please go home per order of the governor. If, okay. if you encounter the same people or group of people night after night after night, that's when they can start to, to consider using the nuisance order. Okay. Um, two more things and then I'm all set. Uh, sure. In terms of the other changes with the governor's announcement today, masks at all times outside, regardless of the ability to maintain six feet of separation. Yes, which again, we are trendsetters. When we originally set the Board of Health order uh, back in the spring, that was our original uh, order. And then within a week or two, we clarified it to say when you can't maintain right. physical distancing. So the governor has now enacted what we had said initially. 
So his supersedes our local order. So when I'm downtown, this is hard for me. Yes. Because I hadn't been doing it before. Right. I will have no problem adapting. But when I walk out of one store and I'm waiting for the light to change to cross the street to walk into another store, my mask is on. Yes. Even if I'm alone. Correct. And as I walk home, yes. my mask is on. Yes. Okay. Last question is, um, the governor said that he thought that the order, th these changes would be about a month. We'll see where we are in a month. That puts us at the end of November. Um, he did talk about uh, the combined lack of distancing, lack of mask wearing, um, in close contact lack of distancing, the drinking and eating as being the main drivers as I took it for these changes. Um, when I think about town meeting, none of those things pop into my mind. Right. Okay. And he did indicate that at the state level, there has been a 300% increase <laughs> in daily new cases since Labor Day. So mm -hmm. that is very consistent with the surge that we've seen at the local level, is mm -hmm. that the numbers have just skyrocketed. And you know, it's, it's the confluence of factors that you just mentioned. There, as it's getting cooler, people are moving inside, people have been cooped up for months and haven't been interacting with their uh, social groups, and they're st now starting to stretch the limits and get together in the backyard, around the fire pit, and sometimes there's some consumption going on and they're too close, and all of that is, you know, over an extended period of time is enough for the virus to spread. And, and what we're seeing, uh, as we were discussing with the, the schools today, looking at their cases, they've had uh, quite a few cases that have impacted the schools mm -hmm. in, in the last two weeks. Most of those students that have been diagnosed usually got it from a parent. Um, so it's the household spread that's taking place but it's then impacting the students ability to to be with their peers oftentimes and, and learn in person okay thank you absolutely thanks tina a um, couple of things mike um, first is to underline some statistics the uh, information you've shared with us uh, and, and which is now available in more of a summary format on our website you've been kind enough to reduce the statistics into a bit of a readable format seems to offer that the um, the cases in the last several days are primarily in the 0 to 9 range and 10 to 19 year old range. Would you correlate those numbers and that, those statistics with statewide figures? Yes. The, uh, the governor and the Department of Public Health are both indicating <laughs> that the surge that they've seen in the last three to four weeks have been uh, mostly cases of people under age 39. And consequently that has to be drawn back to the September time frame when schools emerged and uh, started their in-person um, teaching. Would you say that that's probably uh, I would I would not say that that's causation uh, or, or that there's a correlation. Uh, again, most of our contact tracing is suggesting that the students who are being diagnosed with it, a lot of them were getting it from a parent who brought it into the household. But the consequence is the child could go to school asymptomatic and become a spreader. And so yes. And then bad things happen. That it, they, uh, there is a concern. So there's a tremendous amount at stake. And I, and I think it's worth noting that today, you know, we're having our weekly meeting with you um, over the last week or two. We've seen our own community numbers start to trend. We took steps to amplify our message, which was, I think, well received. This afternoon, some people, if you want to speak to it, received an electronic message from the Department of C Public Health. Clearly, um, people have let their guards down. Um, and it's time to go back to the behaviors that we had at the initial stage of this pandemic and start becoming a lot more vigilant <coughs> and attentive to the basic things that Ms. Hine just mentioned. We just have to adhere to uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and um, stay within a proper social circle that we can maintain a, a, healthy, uh, a healthy existence. So from my perspective, one of the things I'd like you to talk about is the steps that we're doing in Holliston to make us safer every day um, the Blackboard message is important. Um, the information we share on our website is important. What else can you tell people to do besides the normal day-to-day -day things to amplify their efforts to put Holliston's numbers back into a proper healthy trend? What we really need to do is understand that unless we take individual action and assume personal responsibility, than exactly what you just mentioned a few <coughs> moments ago with regards to the impact on the schools and sectors of our economy will suffer. Uh, the steps that the governor has taken with today's executive orders that go into effect on Friday are largely focused on trying to ensure that we can curb 
the spread of the disease in our community so that we don't have to shut down additional sectors of our economy as we did in the spring mm -hmm. or so that we don't have to shut down schools to in-person learning again. Mm -hmm. And so it is sacrificing and as Ms. Hines said, when you walk out of the store, instead of what you used to do if there was nobody around on the sidewalk was you would doff your, your mask. And when you were on the trail, if there was nobody around, you would take your mask off because it's easier to breathe. The studies have shown that uh, this is aerosolized, that you need to keep uh, its source isolation. You need to keep your droplets to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're asking people, uh, again, just as we said, please uh, consider doing an alternative Halloween. It's a hard message, but we're asking people don't get together as a large family gathering for, for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. The message is you really need to limit your contact with folks who are not in your household. Uh, so it's not just your family, because a lot of people have uh, been a little bit more loose lately and have been getting extended family who don't live in their household together, and that's where this spread is occurring. So the message is we need to continue to sacrifice so that for the greater good. Uh, it's too much at stake here. Um, did you have a follow-up? I, I did have one question. So the numbers of 19 and under being where we're seeing the largest increase in our cases in Holliston, I think that was what you had said, John. It is, according to his How message. are they getting this message? Because we're talking here, it'll go out on Holliston Reporter. Sure. The phone and the email and the house line, landline lit up last week, but I'm doubting that there are many 19-year-olds or younger who are in this group that we're seeing the numbers increase within uh, are getting these messages. Are we partnering well with the schools to send this message out to the student directly, to the young adult directly? How are we capturing the 20 to 29 year old who may or may not be paying too close attention by no fault of their own, just right. where they are in their life? How are we connecting with those individuals? Certainly, so there are some groups that we have a much better linkage to. Obviously the younger students, the messaging through the schools is going directly to the parents. <coughs> and the interim superintendent and the individual building principals have been very good at communicating new cases each time one comes at a school. They don't differentiate between whether it's a student or a staff member. They just say someone associated with this school. Uh, and then they say, if you were determined to be in direct contact, we, we would have been in contact with you directly. Um, so the messaging is going out through the schools for the pretty much 18 and under mm -hmm. to the parents. Right. In terms of the messaging directly to that middle category, uh, I think we've got some, some room for improvement and right. if you have any ideas how we can reach them because uh, I, would, I would venture to say that a lot of <laughs> them haven't signed up for the blackboard notice. No. Um, and if they're still living at home, hopefully their, their parents are passing on the, the message to them. Um, you all set? Yes, thank you. Mike, uh, moving on to another area that's uh, related to this topic um, is scheduling of our special town meeting uh, relatively a month from now, Yes. December 5th. Um, if it were tomorrow, would you be recommending that we have a town meeting given the circumstances? Yes. I believe that we are demonstrating on a daily basis and on a weekly basis uh, the schools, uh, even at 50% of their normal uh, occupancy are able to conduct in-person learning for hours on, on end each day uh, with proper physical distancing, with hand sanitizing, with uh, face covering, and there is not spread occurring. So provided anyone who comes to our town meeting, who's a registered voter, uh, doesn't have any symptoms, hasn't been exposed to anybody, uh, isn't awaiting testing themselves, uh, meet all of the criteria for being able to attend to things in person, mm -hmm. uh, I would feel very comfortable that we could uh, safely conduct a special town meeting. Would you recommend to this board that we examine the enactment of the special uh, legislation to control the quorum? Reduce Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, the town clerk, myself as emergency management director, and the uh, town moderator all were in favor of a lower quorum back uh, for our annual town meeting mm -hmm. and that was when our case loads were much lower the situation in the state was much different uh, in light of that it would absolutely be my recommendation that the board uh, publish notice to the community of its intent to uh, discuss uh, lowering the quorum 
and uh, it would be my recommendation that you lower the quorum. So at this point, Mr. O'Hearn, if I could ask you to, in the next week or so, place this on the board's agenda to address as we get maybe a little closer to the middle of s November to assess a decision um, along this line for the December special town meeting. Absolutely. Anything else? Uh, anybody on our Zoom call have questions for Chief Cassidy regarding the coronavirus community update? Carol, go ahead. Hi, how are you tonight? I'm doing good, thanks. Um, this all goes into effect on Friday? Am I correct with the new legislation, or is it now? The executive orders that were signed by the governor with regards to the stay-at-home advisory, <laughs> the closing of indoor recreation, uh, the restaurants not being able to do table service, uh, liquor stores having to close, and indoor gathering sizes and outdoor gathering size at private residences, those all go into effect Friday morning at 12.01 a.m. And the same with the mask wearing, or is that immediate? That also goes into effect uh, at 12.01 on Friday morning. Okay, um, not that I'm trying to be picky here, but uh, so is this going to pertain to people walking, jogging, bicycling? Yes, um, if, if someone is in public, uh, the order would would remain in effect, regardless of okay. of one's ability to physically distance. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the Zoom call this evening for Chief Cassidy on this matter? You know, I want to make one more remark. Uh, seeing none, um, picking up on what Tina mentioned, um, I did speak to the Chief Stone today about the nature of Hollis and Police Department's role in monitoring the community's activities. Um, he said, to his knowledge, there have been no reports to the Hollis and Police Department of large gatherings. Um, they are in a reactive mode for this um, uh, level of enforcement. And he, I think the message is if the community feels as though there's something askew outside the uh, established boundaries of assembly that you've just discussed, um, they should make a report to Holliston uh, PD, who will look into it. Um, they, um, they are not proactive. They are not knocking on doors. They're not looking to interrupt any type of perceived assembly. Um, so at this point, um, they're, they're prepared to respond to something if it were reported. Correct. And I think that's an important component of what you would talk about earlier, Tina. Uh, I think at this point we'll move on to the second part of the agenda, which is the uh, CARES update, Chief, if you want to bound into that, please. I have no requests from any uh, department heads or boards or committees. Uh, just one uh, reminder that uh, I am in the process of preparing the Q3 report to ANF, which is due on November 13th, which is also the deadline for the schools to give their Q3 report to DESE. Mm -hmm. uh, and to that end, we will be having a, a joint meeting later on this week to uh, just check in and see how we are in terms of spending from the, the different uh, federal sources of funds. Um, and I anticipate that I'll be able to file without any difficulty by next Friday, as well as I'm confident in the business manager's uh, ability to, to file his reports. And, and we're, we're collaborating and, and ensuring that w we're making sure that uh, all expenses are tracked appropriately. Right. That's the, um, you, you have a regular communication, if not daily, with schools on a number of different things. Um, Mr. Hearn has made arrangements for a meeting this Thursday. It's the second one this quarter between the schools, um, the uh, school committee chairwoman, the business manager, and myself, Mr. Hearn, yourself, to, as well as Dr. Cusker, of course, to review the status of funding and concerns related to COVID management in the school environment. Um, I think our board has always said from the beginning the schools have our full support uh, to do what they need to do. Um, Mr. Hearn set up sort of a midpoint um, meeting for us to check in with them and have that conversation. So we'll report back of any uh, meaningful content. Um, that's it, Chief. Any other questions from the Zoom for Chief Cassidy before we release and go to the next form of our agenda? Great. Seeing none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. We are now more moving on to warrants. Mr. Sparrow. We have one warrant. 
I'm going to make a motion to approve the warrant in the amount of $601,336.35. Of that, $131,905.79 is town payroll. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 That carries. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Moving on to public comment. Mr. Sparrow? Yes, I have a couple quick things. Um, Are you on public comment? Stand by. I'll call for public comment. We're going to deal with the board public comment first. Hold on, okay? Go ahead, Baron, Ben. Uh, a couple quick things. Um, first is Hello? just... Hello? Hang on one second. Hey, we'll on. be calling for public comment relative to the people on the Zoom in just a minute, okay? We're going to go with board uh, select board feedback first. Hang on. Um, so just the first thing is, is a reminder, there's a winter parking ban starting uh, on November 1st. No street parking. Um, it, uh, in between 1 and 5 a.m. until March. Uh, second thing is is the reminder about fall curbside leaf pickup. Um, it's the week of November 30th, 2020. If you need more information, you can find more information on the town website. I've said it a couple times, so I'm just reminding everybody that it's there. Um, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the other thing is, is just a reminder to people that uh, uh, tomorrow is election day. Um, early voting has concluded, so if you have not yet voted, be sure to go to the high school and uh, vote during the designated uh, time frame, which is, uh, I forget the hours off the top of my head. 7 to 8, I believe, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's 7 to 8. But just a reminder to make sure that you go to the high school and vote in person if you have not yet voted and you wish to. Uh, and um, just a reminder also to, uh, let's remember to be respectful and kind to one another. Uh, regardless of who wins and we're all in this together and we're a community and let's look out for each other and um, consider everybody uh, just want to make sure that you know we, we're, we're good to each other no matter who wins tomorrow so uh, that's all I have thank you very much or who wins Wednesday or, or who Wednesday. wins or whatever day it is or whatever <laughs> happens just make sure we're all Tina <laughs> well to, to that to that end uh, <laughs> You know, I think there's a lot of attention, a lot of uh, questions perhaps in some people's minds about how the counting of ballots will happen. So I got an update from our town clerk, which I will read so folks can have their questions answered if they have any. All early absentee and mail-in ballots, so early absentee mail-in ballots, will be put through the tabulators throughout the day tomorrow on Election Day. Um, the clerk and her staff, their job does not end until all of those ballots are processed. Ballots can be dropped off tomorrow in the ballot box here at Town Hall until 8 p.m. They will be counted. Mail-in ballots with a postmark of November 3rd will be accepted until 5 p.m. on November the 6th. Final tabulation of those ballots will be on November 9th. So I hope that answers anyone's questions about the timing of uh, counting of ballots and so on. Thank you. Um, tomorrow, uh, theoretically, we'll conclude a rather long election season for the town clerk's office. We've been monitoring and speaking with them throughout um, the last several months um, to say they've done Herculean work is an understatement. I don't think they're alone. The burdens placed on town clerks across the state has been um, quite heavy and I can say to date um, they've done a phenomenal job um, and I want to uh, extend my thanks to them in advance. Tomorrow's a long, long day um, and I know a lot of them Probably wish they could be in the Caribbean the week after, but they'll have to just uh, virtually get there. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for all you do um, for the volunteers as well as the staff from the town clerk's office. Okay, now we'll move on to the Zoom um, participants who may have some public comment. Uh, at this point, please raise your hand. I'll recognize you. I'll need your name and address. Hi, can I speak now? Yes, please. Okay, hi, sorry. Um, this is Beth Hoffer, 184 Winthrop Street. Um, I just wanted to get back in touch. I had last spoken with the board on March 9th, <laughs> although there's no mention of it in the board meetings that I had addressed the board, and I don't know quite why that is. Um, but during that meeting, I was told because um, we were talking about the fact that I've been given so many different dates for the completion of the water filtration plant. And I was told that the final date I would be given was November of 2021. And if you look on the website today, it says summer of 2022. So 
So when so does anyone know what's going on? Uh, I'm going to pivot to, to the town administrator, Mr. Hearn, in just a second, Beth, but uh, when were you told about the November 2021 date? When I was sitting at, um, with the selectmen on March 9th of 2021. To, you mean when I attended your meeting, but it, it I, might, the fact that I was there didn't make the minutes. I don't know why, but I did watch the video. Right. So just a couple things and, you said. Um, and, we, and somebody has said, yes, you know, you deserve to know the date. It's been changing a lot, and you deserve to know, and this is the date, mm -hmm. November 2021. And you can watch the video. Right. So that was in March of 2020. No, it was a few months ago. Earlier this year, 2020. Oh, is that where we are? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, March 2020. <laughs> I, I'm with you half the time, so I'm <laughs> just confirming that. <laughs> Beth, I wanted to... trying to push it forward. One of the things I wanted to, if I could, I'll, I'll get to you in just a second, Travis. I, I want to recognize Beth as just one of the more fastidious and thoroughly prepared citizens we work with. Beth, you've been um, on this project from the very beginning, and uh, you know, you've, you've received my appreciation for your contributions. You and I had some extensive conversations in the spring following your March appearance before us. Um, and at that time, there were some changes made to the, um, the way this project was being handled. So I want to reflect that as part of what we're talking about. So following okay. that, uh, sorry, well, let me I'm just. just who, who, who am I speaking to right now? This is John Cronin. Okay, thank you, John. So following our conversations in March, excuse me, um, May, we decided to start putting project updates on the website. We had not been doing that to date. And we also informed the town, especially through um, the annual town meeting, that the treatment plant time frame had shifted. And I believe we had extensive emails and conversations about why that shifted, why that moved. And it certainly did move from November of 2021 into 22. So you were informed at that time that the project timeline had moved. Do you not recall that? I guess not with everything that's going on. That's quite all right. I, there's a lot going on, and I appreciate that. But you also call for the fact that the progress report updates would be meaningful to residents. Now, I notice on our town website right now we have the treatment plant progress update as of September 30th, which is about, let's call it a month ago. Let's ask town administrator town uh, Travis or Hearn for an update on when we can expect the next one to be posted. Okay. Well, I I have some other comments. If okay. That's all right. Why don't you get your comments uh, out of the way and then we'll have Travis address it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Go. Okay. So, from what I'm reading, that's posted now on the project page. It looks like this project is going to be going over budget by more than a million dollars. Is that correct? We don't know yet because the project has not been put out to bid. What, we de what we've done is we've recognized that through some recent estimations that the project cost may exceed the authorized amount. Mr. Ahern will give us and an- why, 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 I understand you can't go out to bid before you go to town meeting, but wouldn't you do the planning portion, like the $600,000 for design and engineering, which then you could go to town meeting and know how much you need? That's and not be off by over a million dollars? Nope, you're exactly right, and Travis is going to give us that as part of his update in just a second to describe what that, um, what that process entails. So stand by for that answer. Okay, well, all I know is I, you know, I think I finally figured out, and it shouldn't be up to me to figure out what's going on with the water at my residence, um, and it shouldn't have taken the state DEP to come in to finally have somebody come look into it and I don't care what date this filtration plant is going to be done I need something done now and I don't know if I need to get an attorney I don't know if I need to go to public media I haven't wanted to go to the papers because if this gets out everybody's property is going to be devalued in town and so I've been holding off on that but I just cannot wait any longer mm -hmm. 
And okay. I believe that you should have received my documentation um, that I sent to you. For some reason, uh, the Board of Assessors think my, my house is full value without water that can be used, and I don't understand that. Um, I don't know when someone will address my concerns that I brought up, and we don't need to do it now, obviously. I won't take up your time with it, but I do expect it to be done soon because I can't go on much longer. Mm -hmm. So that is what I have to say tonight. I can confirm for myself, I don't know about my colleagues, that we did receive your most recent um, correspondence. The, the matter involving your, your ask, I'm going to direct to Mr. Ahern to find out what, if anything, more can be done to help um, you at your residence. Um, so we'll ask him to add that to his remarks as well. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Anything else, Beth? Well, I mean, no. I, don't, I mean, there is more, but I'm not going to take up your time right now. Cause okay. You know well, what I mean? Okay. No, I got you. So uh, we're here every week, so you can come in. But um, let's have Travis well, respond. Well, no, but I do. I do. I mean, I, I want my correspondence to be seriously considered and replied to at some point in the near future. I will say that. Got it. I agree with you. Okay. Hold on. Thank let's you. Let's see what Travis has to say. Mr. Hearn. So we did receive that, um, and I've been in contact with the Water Department regarding all the things um, that have been tried and, and sort of uh, worked out in the area, not just this particular house, but the, the neighborhood surrounding it uh, to see what has worked and what hasn't. Um, and so, you know, we can certainly look at uh, an official response to, to the, cor the correspondence that you received. Um, and, you know, th there, is, there is quite a long list of things that the Water Department has, has done to address the issue. Um, that's been brought forward to them, so uh, we can uh, we can put that as me, a. I just and I want to welcome you to town, and I'm sorry to be jumping in like this, but um, I have a unique situation at this location. It's been going on for about 15 years, um, and when they they did do the blow off after the state DEP and after an engineer got involved, not not for me, um, but then they immediately had to turn it off and it cannot run during the winter anyway. So they really haven't done too much. So just to be clear, okay, sorry. So I think, I think um, as was mentioned, you know, sort of responding and, and compiling all of what has been done or, or what, you know, the, the resident would like to still consider, uh, I think is the next step we can certainly take. Um, and so I will bring that back to you. As regard to the update on the water treatment plan itself, uh, I think what was stated earlier was, you know, bringing back numbers once design is is been completed, and, and that's where we are. This board has has approved the warrant article for eight hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, which has now been sent to the finance committee to be reviewed, and then would go on the warrant um, with a recommendation from them. The six hundred thousand dollars for design engineering is now at ninety five percent complete. Uh, and that is what has led to the request for the additional $850,000. Assuming, um, you know, that we, the max amount that we feel may come back in the bid process over the winter, December into January, to keep us on the, the timeline that uh, the chair highlighted earlier, um, to go out to bid, it's possible that that $850,000 would not be necessary, but what we're doing is, is setting ourselves up to have the um, amount that we think that they could be called for based on 95% design. Travis, so real quick, because this is an important point. I'm sh I don't want to preempt what Beth might be asking, but I can guess. Um, kindly inform people to, in a very basic way what was driving or what has driven that cost estimate to reach the level that you just mentioned, please. What changed? So the part of it is the timeline um, in that construction costs into 21 and 22 are greater than when the when it was originally conceived as a project uh, and sort of discussed conceptually with the town uh, with the original appropriation. Uh, additionally, there have been some calls for changes in scope to the project. Some of those are driven by DEP. Um, they're not things that, you know, sort of, uh, if all you're interested in is the water are, are all that compelling, but, you know, lining of lagoons and things of that nature that have been called for by DEP, that the design has to come and add into, um, add cost to it. Uh, and then we've had a couple smaller things having to do with bathrooms and those types of things. Those are starting to um, 
become clarified uh, as we approach this so that we feel like $850,000 is the right number as we go into the December 5th town meeting to keep us on track. And then I would just um, state, as, as Ms. Hoffer mentioned, the timeline. The, the 2022 timeline is based on construction taking 15 to 18 months. Um, obviously, the amount of time that that construction period takes will impact when the plan is open. Uh, additionally, with DEP testing on the back end to make sure everything's in compliance before it opens and goes live. Uh, all of those things are considered within that timeline. If everything goes well, that timeline could become more favorable, uh, but we don't want to set unrealistic expectations and run into issues. Um, could I, hold on one second, Beth. Could I ask that you um, have the uh, DPW Director, Mr. Reese, uh, provide us a report uh, next week on the status of Ms. Hoffer's property and what is or what is planned to be done to um, help her through this process. Uh, she's been enduring quite a lot, but we want to make sure that we're doing all we can, okay? Yep. We'll get an update next week. Absolutely. Go ahead, Tina, did you have a question? Beth, did you have something else you wanted to say? Because I have a couple quick questions for you. Okay, yeah, just that um, my, uh, on top of everything, well, first of all, we don't even have the $8 million yet. And we have to get another 800000 So I understand we're waiting on a loan from the state or to hear if we're going to get that loan. Um, and then if the 800000 is approved at town meeting, the additional money, then is that another loan process or where do we go for that? Travis. Sure. So just to clarify um, what what the resident is referring to when it comes to the state process. So there is a, um, there, it's called the state revolving fund where you can borrow uh, for water and sewer projects through the state. They give you a flat 2% um, rate, which is generally historically more favorable than the market. At the current time, it is because of interest rates, it, it is not all of that, it is not all that favorable for the town. So I do not think that um, waiting on the SRF would impact our timeline as a town. I think if we wanted to go out and borrow um, and we felt the SRF was going to hold us up, I don't think that would impede this project. That's my personal opinion. Um, and so that is correct that the borrowing authorization of a previous town meeting was eight million three seventy five. that we have an application into the SRF for that amount to borrow. And then just to the point on the $850,000, as this board, um, I, I presented to this board, and I have not yet finalized the conversation with the Finance Committee, there are multiple ways to raise that $850,000, one of which is to raise the borrowing authorization, another is to use um, cash, whether it be free cash um, or the capital expenditure fund. There's multiple ways to fund that, including increasing the borrowing authorization. So that is still a conversation that, that needs to be fleshed out before town meeting on December 5th. Um, but again, the borrowing authorization is in place, the application is into the SRF, but I do not think that, that, that this project is contingent on the SRF's finding. And it won't, so at no point will it require an override, is that correct? Because I don't understand all the terminology you're using. So No, this no. would not require an override. Okay, and then the other thing, um, from my understanding, the $600,000 that was taken from it, the water fund i don't know exactly again the right terminology but that was money that was from the water department um initially that was to bring down the cost of the loan um but then it was decided that you're still going for the 8.375 so in actuality well i guess you're you're saying nobody knew how much it was going to cost when you went to town meeting and that's why we're going over okay i'm done all right, Beth, thanks so much. Um, I, I, I hope you heard me. We were going to ask Mr. Hearn to report back on the status of your property. Um, I'm hoping that uh, somebody will be in touch with you regarding that. Uh, we'll get a public response from him in a week or so, okay? Okay, so I think Tina said, Tina, did you say you had a couple of questions? Real quick, or no? real quick in, your, in your email to us on the 22nd of October, you mentioned that you applied for an abatement with the Board of Assessors. Have you gotten a response from them? Yes, it was denied. Okay, and I can take it. To, I can take it to the state. Okay, but it's a hundred dollars. Okay, <laughs> um, to appeal it. So I didn't know if there was another way to appeal it without my having to spend a hundred another hundred dollars toward yeah. this whole situation. The appellate tax board is the area for relief after that, Beth. 
I'm sorry, what? The appellate tax board is the area for relief after you're denied an abatement from the assessors. So that's the state? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. Okay, so it's, okay. So, you know, I haven't put enough money into this already. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Any other questions and public comment this evening? Hearing none, uh, let's get back to the agenda. I think at this point we're going to be saying hello to Mr. Uh, Keist. Okay. We're going to, oh, excuse me, one second, got to have uh, Travis weigh in. Briefly, comments from the town administrator and warrant discussion. Sorry, James. Stand by, No, James. sorry, we did flip it so that James would be first. Okay, come on in. <laughs> but James is going to stay with us because he'll be here in case there's any questions on some of the warrant articles later. Um, and then may stick around as well for the rest of the conversation later in the evening. Well, thank you for having me. Good evening. Uh, I just want to give you a quick update on what we've done in the facilities department for Holliston. Chris has a presentation up on the screen. I just have it here. Um, I want to start with, uh, you can go to the next slide, Chris, uh, the milestones. And um, I'm happy to report that we've completed all of the uh, tasks that were set uh, in the facility manager employment plan. So those were tasks that we had set uh, to be completed within the first year. We've done them in the first eight months. And basically, it's engaging with all stakeholders, establishing communication procedures, and a work order submittal process. So if there's issues with uh, various uh, town buildings or, or problems that need to get repaired, the folks know where to go to um, you know, submit a work order so that we can then get the, the issue taken care of. One of the big uh, components of year one was to research and select a computerized maintenance management software system. We've cho chosen Dude Solutions. It was originally called School Dude. Uh, I don't know how they came up with the name, but uh, they've now changed to Dude Solutions, and it's, uh, it's uh, um, going to really, really uh, add some value to the town, uh, add some value to the, to the position. Uh, one of the big components of it, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, is uh, the ability to um, plan and uh, have a, a capital... Uh, plan in place for the replacement of major components within the town buildings uh, and it will allow us to uh, to look down the road uh, this tool actually forecasts it out to 2040 so we do have uh, quite a window um, uh, into the future uh, and you know key component to that started with a facility condition assessment so myself as well as the folks from dude solutions we reviewed all of the town buildings uh, we established baseline conditions, so what's the current condition as we are today? Um, and, uh, and then uh, based on the condition of the programs, we've established preventative maintenance programs. So equipment A requires XYZ in terms of service to prolong its, its life. Uh, equipment C is beyond its useful life, so we're not going to invest in that. We're going to plan to replace those types of things. And as I just alluded to, uh, the tool allows us to develop a long-term capital improvement plan for these particular assets in town. As a side note, we've processed and closed 90, 90 plus, I did a count today, it's a little over 90, almost 100 facility work orders. And these can be simple things, uh, lights out in an office, uh, we need a file cabinet moved or, you know what, something more serious, you know, there is no heat in a particular building uh, and addressing those concerns. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the projects that we've completed in the first eight months. Uh, one of the top on the list was prepare the facilities for um, COVID-19, for the reopening. <coughs> a lot of work went into signage, a lot of work went into even in this particular building, the physical barriers um, uh, put up on a, the uh, service counters. Uh, other buildings, we've installed uh, plexiglass barriers. All of this was done um, to allow a safe environment for our employees and for the town residents to come in. We completed the 260, 260 Woodland Street cleanup. 
that's now done and that lot is now available for any use that we so choose. Uh, they replaced uh, the doors at, at Pinecrest Golf Club. Uh, there were four sets of double doors and two single doors that were replaced that were in really bad condition. In fact, the lower sides of the doors were so rotted that you could put your hand through them. Uh, the cupola on top of that building was repaired uh, and the snack shack that's off by the number 90 had a new roof and uh, some trim replaced on that. The senior center uh, doors were repaired and the kitchen compliant issues are addressed. They're almost complete, but uh, basically 99% done. Uh, completed an analysis on the wastewater treatment plant. There was, when I first joined, there was uh, an article uh, to, uh, you know, for $53,000 to do an analysis for that particular plant. I was told when I uh, first came in that that had to be done, uh, but um, I conducted my own analysis as well as uh, brought in two additional experts for no charge to evaluate that plant, and the plant is okay. Can it be better? Can it be more efficient? Certainly, but at this point, especially with it not getting, you know, being used, uh, you know, from uh, the schools being closed for so long, as well as mm -hmm. at basically 50% capacity uh, in terms of the schools now, um, you know, we push that off. If we want to have, um, um, you know, a more uh, efficient system, we can certainly invest in that, but at this time, my recommendation was no, so we pulled that off. And in fact, Simple things like the aeration pumps there that are very powerful pumps. They um, consume a lot of electricity. They were running full bore the whole time, even when the schools weren't on. So I worked with our, our uh, management company that, that runs that facility to dial those back so we could at least save some money on electricity while that facility isn't being used. Mm -hmm. uh, at the police station, we had some uh, issues with the wall. Uh, these were design issues. We did try to... Um, you know, work through um, uh, the insurance company in terms of a claim, uh, but uh, we weren't able to do that. But the good news is, is that we um, did a, uh, a design enhancement to prevent this problem from happening in the future. Uh, and the issue has been solved and the area is cleaned up and the risk of uh, further damage is no longer there. And then uh, lastly, uh, and again, these are just uh, key projects that uh, or tend to be larger in scale. Uh, the Pinecrest issues, the parking related to the uh, up at Pinecrest, we took care of that. Next slide, Chris. Uh, I know this is all riveting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got questions. We'll, we'll, go, we'll, 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 we'll go through it uh, a little more quickly. So these are projects that I'm working on now. Um, and uh, it's the walkway and ramp at uh, the Parks and Rec building, we call it 1750. Uh, at Town Hall, we have a number of projects that are uh, in process. Uh, the windows in this building um, are, uh, in some cases, original. Uh, they're in pretty uh, rough condition. They don't close. You can look at the window behind us. There's a one-inch gap between the two sashes, and in the winter when the snow blows in, it's not very pleasant. Ben is the only one wearing a sweater in this room. I can make <laughs> no <laughs> that. So... Uh, that uh, these windows need to be mechanically restored, which uh, this board did approve some funding through COVID to do that. And that was scheduled to be this week. Unfortunately, it's gonna be next week, uh, but that's in process. But there, the glazing on the windows and the painting uh, needs to get taken care of, as well as something to protect them once we, we do the repairs. Uh, so that's a big uh, project uh, that I did go to CPC and got their approval for uh, some funds to do those repairs. It's now waiting for town meeting for approval. Same thing with the floor uh, in the grand hall upstairs. Uh, did get approval from CPC to re replace that floor. Unfortunately, it's beyond its useful life. It can't be sanded anymore. The nail heads are exposed, so that will be replaced. Uh, we also have the septic system in town hall that uh, um, we're in the process of um, you know, finalizing. Um, I believe Travis is going to be speaking about that in a little bit. And we're in process of in, in, in replacing the front doors and the side door. Uh, the gentleman, um, the, or the company that we're working with, uh, they came out at the end of last week. We're doing some additional measurements. Um, when those go in, we're also going to have them preset for our electronic pass system, pass key system. Um, and so when we want to upgrade to that and install that system, 
uh, the doors will be ready for that. Uh, the library uh, heating and ventilation controls. Uh, right now, it's basically a Rube Goldberg machine in there in terms of trying to get this <laughs> thing to work. I was there this morning trying to get the heat on. It was 57 degrees in that building. Um, and so uh, have a plan in place to uh, replace the control systems with that units. The, the actual physical air handlers and boilers and whatnot are in good shape, but the things that control them um, are archaic. Uh, the front facade of the library is, is failing. Uh, the mortar joints uh, between the, the stonework have failed. Water is getting in. Um, it's, um, you know, especially when you get the freezing, you know, warm days and then the freezing nights, you get the freezing and expansion. A piece already fell off. Um, so it's a concern um, that, that uh, you know, significant damage uh, can happen if we don't take care of that soon. Also went to the CPC and did get approval for getting that work. Again, it needs to go to town, town meeting. The uh, water tanks, uh, specifically the one on Hopping Brook, and another one up here behind Town Hall, Mount Hollis, off of Fair Lane Way, has uh, cell tower communication equipment on it. I'm in the process of working um, with our uh, council to renegotiate some of those contracts. <coughs> one particular tank, uh, the um, electric service that comes in is our, the town owns uh, utility service and the mobile uh, communication company up there has been using our electricity I went through and did an analysis it's about thirty five thousand uh, dollars a little bit over that of electricity that they've used it's the towns I'm uh, working with them now to get a reimbursement they in fact did an analysis of their own and came up with pretty much the same number which is good news the critical thing is is that uh, emergency communication equipment that's going up there uh, for uh, the town's emergency services needs to utilize this our service that's up there so this mobile communication company needs to switch over to their own service uh, we're in the process they're working with Eversource to get that done uh, 9 Green Street uh, it's the property in downtown working with a number of folks including including Miss Hine on uh, the best uh, plan for that building. We know the building needs to come down. It's dilapidated. Kids are crawling on the roof. Uh, it is a hazard. Um, and uh, you know we don't have to get into the details of it, but uh, there's certain things that restrict what we can do with that particular site. Uh, working with Matt um, Zedek on the Marshall Street Recycle Center, as well as the DPW. As a result of uh, the work that was done at 260 Woodland, the DBW is challenged for a lay down area where they can put temporary uh, you know, road work equipment, uh, road debris or uh, uh, yard debris um, from you know, cleanups that they may do. Uh, so we're looking to see how we could possibly expand with the Marshall Street as well as add other um, services at that location, maybe even put in a horseshoe driveway, um, but that's in process. Um, Green Communities grants were approved. Um, we're putting in solar lights at Pinecrest Golf Club and the parking lot as well as the building. Uh, didn't get a chance to update this, but the police station boiler, I, I think we're going to take that off the plate. Uh, the grant wasn't for the full replacement of that boiler. Um, and we went, uh, did reach out to some additional contractors to see if we could at least get the installation cost down. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like we can do that. We can obviously talk about that under uh, the uh, warrant update. Uh, in terms of the computer software, uh, we're probably about 90% done with the programming. Uh, so that's you know not completed, but uh, I do have all the data. It's basically in an Excel format. And it's not um, really in a user-friendly state, uh, and that is now being uploaded into the software system. It'll allow us to really do some uh, great trending analysis in terms of the assets, <laughs> the conditions of the buildings, and then capital planning and, and, and with the forecast. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk at the end about uh, the town building's uh, electric suppliers. Right now we're using Eversource. The Eversource rate is much higher than if we can buy off the spot market or even work with a, an energy broker. Uh, I have a proposal we'll talk about at the end of this uh, where we could save about $66,000 a year on electrical costs for the town. That's all. That includes the schools, that includes the water treatment plants, um, street lights, uh, town buildings.
Um, and then uh, started working with the golf course advisory committee on the renovation project for 2021 at the golf course. It involves uh, improving some drainage issues, uh, redoing some of the cart paths. Um, uh, I walked through with the, the committee uh, earlier last week, and then I got the conservation agent, Ryan Clamp, involved, getting his opinion, and so we're starting that process. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, working with Parks and Recreation, they have some buildings at Stoddard Park, that, uh, including the buildings with the bathrooms. Um, there's some um, rotting of the subfloors in one of the bathrooms, which is uh, creating an unsafe condition. Uh, the siding is rotting. Um, there's just uh, poor maintenance that's happened to those structures. Uh, and now working with them to um, get some quotes on getting that work done, and then that board will then uh, decide what to do from there. Next slide, please. Um, moving forward, um, you know, I'd like to start discussing, in fact, Travis and I have had a lot of discussions about this in terms of centralizing uh, maintenance and repair budgets for the town facilities and centralizing being either maybe it remains with the individual uh, department heads, but at least there's visibility and over general oversight of it, or it does come into one big pool. We can discuss that. Uh, we'd like to try to get that in place for FY22. Um, also for FY22, I want to start getting competitive annual contracts, you know, putting these things out for bid to get the best value for all the facility cleaning, all of the HVAC maintenance and repairs, and obviously utilities and anything else. Um, you know, we have uh, this through Dude Solutions, we uh, have the ability to really develop a long-term capital improvement town, uh, plan for the town's facilities. We have an accurate plan for major expenses, you know, replacements, roofs, HVA systems. And these are based on the end of life and the end of life based off of escalator replacement costs. So we could say, okay, in 2030, we need a new roof on the town hall. And in $2030, it's gonna cost $250,000, we can now start planning for that and maybe tuck away $100,000 a you know, year or whatever. We, can, we, we have that ability now to be able to do that. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, actually as, as part of that, in terms of the capital improvement plan, I'm a participant in the capital subcommittee with the finance uh, committee so that I can then add some input into that. I think it's a great collaboration between the two departments, the two groups. Uh, and then uh, we want to look into expanding into the parks and um, grounds and the fields. That's year two of the employment plan that uh, the committee, that this board has set in place. I've started, you know, helping out the parks um, uh, group uh, with some of the projects they have are going on, but you know, I think we need to start making that more formal moving forward. Next slide, please. And in summary, uh, estimated year to date, I've probably saved the town a little over $100,000 in direct savings in terms of uh, some of the work that I've done myself versus indirect uh, uh, work and then in managing the work that is performed. There's not that there's being excessive uh, repairs or repairs that aren't being necessary um, that are being done. Uh, there's further savings to be gained through annual bidded contracts or return service. Um, we also are going to have uh, accurate financial forecasts for the maintenance and repair of the town's facilities. And of course, we have several projects in various stages of completion. Next slide. That's electric supply. So let's, before we get into that, any questions on the update? My, I hope uh, I didn't ramble too much. That's <laughs> quite all right. Thank Sorry. you, James. My colleague, Ben, uh, I'll start with you. I remember writing a plan with you about yeah, a year we're doing ago. That, going through that process with you. Yes. Do you want to uh, begin sure. any questions for the facility manager? Yeah, you answered a couple of them that I had when I reviewed it this morning. A um, couple others. Um, so on your first slide here, you mentioned that you have, um, I want to get the, engage with stakeholders and establish <laughs> communication procedures. Could you just elaborate a little bit about what the communication procedures are? Like, for example, if, uh, Chief Cassidy has a broken building. Who does does he just call you? Does he do it and then work with you, or how does it? What's the process look like? Just an overview. You don't have to get too specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, the process is is that they would reach out to me, and my 
request is that they go through the work order <coughs> system. So any, you know, you can go onto the town website, and that's where it is now. Yep. It's going to migrate over to the Dude Solutions platform. Okay. Uh, but right now, you can go onto the town website under facilities, submit a work <coughs> order. You can put the information in there. And I want all these requests to go in there so we can keep track of it. And we mm -hmm. can at least have a record now of what we're doing uh, in terms of repair or their particular request. Certainly things that will go in there are, can you help me get this file cabinet from Office Bay to Office B? You know, that's not as critical. But if we're right. doing a, a repair, we have a boiler that stopped working or, or whatever, we want to keep have a record of that and what that repair looks like. So the, the communication process is basically, I do get calls. Um, and I'll, I'll either I'll enter in a work order based off of that call, or they'll, they will, um, you know, after our conversation, we'll enter it into the system, and then that's processed from there. Okay. Okay. Um, so you did answer actually, because I was saying, how are we tracking the work orders at this time? And it sounds like we're doing it through the, the website at this yes. time. Yep. Um, now, just an, another like a procedural point is just that when you're talking to stakeholders, are you doing regular check-in, or are they just kind of calling you when things are broken? No, no, I, I routinely check in with everyone, okay. um, and I physically actually go to each of these properties. I try to go to each place once a week okay, uh, and engage with the folks. Something will pop up, yep. um, and uh, you know, I may go there more often uh, uh, than you know, once a week, but uh, that's generally my, my process. Okay, okay. Are you, um, is there any, are you having any issues, or is anything that you need this board to address? for you or is anything everything going pretty smoothly to this point for you yeah I mean I, I think everything is is going smoothly um, uh, we do need to wrap our hand around sort of the financial component of yep. this yep um, there are certain things that um, you know th th you know having to go through and sign out a you know the town debit card to make a purchase for fifty dollars for something mm -hmm. uh, is quite cumbersome and time-consuming. Sure. Uh, and, um, and I think we do need to get some more controls about you know how we're going to uh, you know handle these types of uh, purchases or okay. that ultimately lead to repairs. But uh, you know I would say right now all the department heads have been uh, very welcoming and very happy with uh, what we're doing for them. I'm sure they're happy. Most of them are happy not to have to worry about yes, the building they stuff. They can, they can kind of like they can own, uh, worry about their expertise. Their position, exactly. exactly. Okay. Um, so, all right. I mean, this is you know, I'm I, I have to say I'm you know I'm I'm very uh, glad to see you aboard. Um, you know, we work together um, on some di just talking about some different things, um, and I just really appreciate you having you here. And I think the next step really is that strategic getting to more strategic planning and yeah. financial. You know, it's something that I, I feel is very important, and I, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm dedicating my services to you and to Travis to help you in that endeavor in what any way that I can. We work together on the capital subcommittee, but I think it's critical that we do get that longer-term planning with respect Absolutely. to how we're managing our buildings. And I think, I think that's a real oversight that we have as a community that we're not doing. We haven't until this point, until we really started investing in you and your position to be able to start really doing that on a, on, a, on a bigger scale to really start looking at those kinds of things and to really have that kind of management. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I mean, there's some, there's some, a couple of things that I'm probably going to talk to you about at some point in the near future. Okay. Um, but we can, you know, talk about once do solutions is kind of more up online and stuff like that. And we can uh, address those kinds of things, but I thank you for this. And, you know, yeah, I think the financial piece is really, it is critical and I look forward to, working with you in the next few months to try to get there um, for the spring so we can give you some financial oversight because I think that's really where one of the strengths of having someone in your position is to be able to have that synergy to be able to work as a to the on behalf of the entire town instead right. of everybody having sort of their own little uh, their own little contract and their own little thing right. that they're doing with some of these th these aspects so thank yeah. you very much for this uh, and um, you know uh, I, again, I, I'm, I'm here to help you in any way that I can. So right, I, anytime I you need it. anything, please let me know. So. Yeah, Thanks. and it's more than just, you know, having funding available. It's really oversight so I can yep. understand uh, and and know that, you know what, uh, you know, this particular work goes on or there was spending on, you know, maintenance and repair mm -hmm. in the previous year uh, on something that we're now having to look at again. Yeah, and, and it so might be... And, and to like to the point about like even the police boiler, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, in, in previous years, I mean, it could have been considered like a, a much more important thing. Mm -hmm. 
on a, on a particular level, but on a grander scale, we might say, you know what, our money could be better right. served in, in, in different places where it's a little bit more um, critical, but Absolutely. you're able to see the whole the big picture for mm -hmm. all these buildings. So right. thank and you. And the wastewater treatment plants are a prime example. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So that's all I have. Thank I you. teed that up nicely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm you're here welcome. to talk about wastewater. Right, right. <laughs> uh, so I think I heard you say, and I'm asking you to confirm if, if I'm this is what I heard you say that it's currently at 50% capacity. Uh, well, 50% of its normal capacity, its de design capacity is yep. actually much greater. Okay. So uh, don't lock me on an exact number. Yep. We're probably now with the schools at 50% capacity. Yep. We're probably running 20, 25% capacity of that plant. All right. So schools functioning normal, kids there five days a week, all kids, all schools. There's a, we're not at capacity. There's room right. for growth in the yes. system. Yes. That's meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in terms of, you dialed back the aeration pump. Mm -hmm. um, you said it improved efficiency and performance, and I think you also said lowered electricity costs. The d dialing back the pumps saved us on the electricity. Yeah. The $53,000 for a study was to improve the efficiency um, there are some uh, challenges um, meeting the DEP testing requirements at that plant. Okay. Uh, just because of the type of waste, basically, that it's treating. Um, but it's not something that I felt, and as well as the two other experts that I brought in, including the folks that manage that plant for us, uh, worth investing in that at this point in time. Okay. Um, you know, if. if it's a much bigger project, and that's just the study, mind you, that doesn't include the repair, which would be significant. This is not, you're not then saying that increasing the capacity gets better performance, better efficiency? Uh, not necessarily, no. Okay. No. Where does the treated wastewater go? Uh, there are two leaching fields <coughs> at that facility. One is in the outfield of the Adams uh, baseball field. Okay. <coughs> and another... I'll get closer. And another is uh, in a field that's back behind Placentino. So if you go all the way down past those buildings, there's a large leaching field back there. Okay. And so the effluent um, discharges, I think, primarily to the first leaching field by Adams. And okay. then there's a second pipe and pump that drives it all the way down to behind Placentino. It then ends up in our aquifer. Yes. Because it goes into the groundwater. Yes, it goes into the groundwater. Okay, yeah. and if we were ever to increase the capacity of our current wastewater treatment plant, would we need to address those leaching fields? Would they need to increase in size to No, there's plenty of leaching fields. Okay. They're, they're okay. The, the fields are sized to the capacity of that plant. Okay. Um, you uh, have here <coughs> for, if you go back two slides, you don't have to here, but you talk about moving forward, expanding department into management of parks, grounds, and fields. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a really significant future uh, task, mm -hmm. agenda item, whatever you want to call it, goal. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you, s in your mind, how committed to the idea of the trail being one of those parks, are you? I, is that 100% in your mind, that the trail is a park? Like the rail trail? Yes. Yes, it is a park. Okay. Um, what kind of work to date have you done to move on this um, task for year two? Very uh, are you little. looking to, okay, so you're <laughs> looking little. to start. Okay, yes, so no, no meaningful conversations No meaningful today. conversations, okay. so that's, that's uh, why have it in the moving forward? Is that something yeah. we need to begin to really look at? To be honest with you, there's not enough of me to do what I'm currently doing now and then incorporate you know, right. a fields. Uh, uh, and this is fields in terms of maintenance of all the grounds around all of the town buildings, as well as the, you know, the baseball fields, the parks, the soccer fields, those types of things. Right, and I think that's traditionally what one would think, so that's why I ask about the trail, because I'm not sure the rail trail was traditionally something that people considered under parks, grounds, and fields. And so to that end, the community farm, mm -hmm. do you see that as something that also falls under parks, grounds, and fields, or have not thought about that? I'm asking too soon, Tina, be quiet. <laughs> Wait <laughs> no, a bit no. on that one. No, it, it, I would say at, at initially, just thinking about it now, I would say not. Okay. But... Uh, but I would maybe say the house and the structures that yeah yeah um, yeah facility yeah. as opposed to the grounds purpose yeah okay I should have clarified that's actually what I meant 
the actual structure. Yes. It's a town so, building. Yeah, right. So uh, it's You've been out needs there. to be looking at it. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, although they are talking about some green space, which we'll see on the 9th when they come mm -hmm. with some open space. But um, then last question here. Uh, when you talk about centralized maintenance and repair of budgets, you kind of went in two different directions where it could live with the department or it could live in a more centralized location, literally yeah. maybe mm -hmm. here in town hall. Are there, ex are there um, expenses that would drive one decision versus the other, or is it more just sort of culture and preference? Just budget structure. Yeah, that's right. right. So okay. if you want to be able to show what a department is paying for, sometimes you want it to live in the department, but you just want to make sure that the costs are sort of overseen by one entity. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And the other thing is, is, is I mean, let's take cleaning service, for example. So we have building A that's using a particular cleaning service, and they have the relationship and building A, B, C, and D, uh, B, D, uh, E, and F have another. I mean, we need to combine that in order. We got to leverage, you know, uh, all of the town cleaning services yeah. uh, for their buildings under one umbrella. And maybe we then, you know, from a budgeting standpoint, maybe that portion for building A is taken out of directly out of their budget. Does it fall in a facilities budget or not? We can have that conversation. But we need to at least look at everything holistically, um, regardless of, of, of if it is a centralized budget within facilities or not. Okay, because I'm looking at how you link the first on that list and the last on that list, especially when you're talking about something like the rail trail. Mm -hmm. You know, so how do you link the tracking of expenses there as as those come under the facilities department? You know, how do you, how is that going to look? I don't think there's an answer yeah, there yeah. today. Yeah, so right, right. Uh, that'll be something I'll be curious to learn a lot mm -hmm. more about mm -hmm. moving forward. That's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Yeah. James, I, looking at the presentation, j I just can't help but think, wow, everything has gone according to plan. Mm -hmm. uh, when we drafted this, we had um, an immediate need, and we were projecting out some needs going forward. Um, I think folks at home should be reminded, how long have you been on the job? Yeah, I was going to ask that. Uh, March 16th, yeah. and then we <laughs> shut down on March 17th. <laughs> under, under eight months, yeah. you've been able to achieve quite a lot, uh, embracing the plan that was put forward. Um, securing the critical tasks of getting the software on board and joining the capital plan and uh, really engaging the various department heads in the facilities that they manage. Um, over the last several months I've heard nothing but glowing remarks from uh, folks involved with uh, facility management, um, most specifically the Pinecrest Golf Club <laughs> uh, as well as Town Hall. Uh, so overall, you know, I think you're doing a tremendous job. You've embraced the plan. Um, I think going forward to kind of go into where ter uh, Tina was heading, the plan does envision a year three. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about year two, which is the management of parks, grounds, and fields, we've got to cast our eye towards year three, which was schools. Right. Um, she, Tina asked you a little bit about how much conversation you've had surrounding um, parks, grounds, and fields with parks. Not a lot to date. Have you had any conversations with the schools about uh, moving into their space and handling some of the facility issues? No. Okay. I have collaborated with the schools uh, when we talk about the utility mm -hmm. aggregation uh, in our program. I definitely right. uh, work with them on that because they're a big user of electricity. But mm -hmm. in terms of building maintenance and, and, and preventive maintenance, no. Got it. Okay. Um, Mr. Hearn, I, I would encourage you as you prepare the FY22 budget to fully embrace the plan as it reflects the uh, parks, grounds, and fields. and when we get into that budget process, um, I think we ha have to have open dialogue with our partners, um, especially with the trails and the parks, to make sure that what we envision makes sense for the town, makes sense for them. I think with James uh, acting as sort of the receiver of any any such duties, uh, people should feel um, quite comfortable knowing it's, it's heading in the right direction. Um, I don't have any other further questions at this point. Let me ask folks on the Zoom call if they've got any questions for our facility manager as he provides his update to the town this evening. Could I just add one thing to that last point on parks? Oh, go right ahead, sure. Sure, so uh, I've also been sitting down with Mark Frank on this as well as I know James has. Um, so I think it's gonna be a, it's a, co a combined effort between James uh, working with Mark Frank and his committee, mm -hmm. uh, the level of service that we're currently getting through the DPW department and sort of seeing best options. I think there's quite a few to be discussed and that's exciting and, and that is certainly going to be the um, a, a prime driver of the FY22, how that all shakes out. I think we can come up with a, a solution to improve service in that area. So let me just check to see if there's any questions from the Zoom call. I have one, one last one. Yep. 
Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Tina, did you have a follow-up question? Well, just to the to the parks and, and rec and mm -hmm. the grounds and then the schools, you mentioned already one man, one person in this role is, uh, year two has is, is got a lot more in it than, than year one. Mm -hmm. When do you see needing in, uh, hire do for your department? People. Oh, uh, when we start taking on that w additional work. So including yeah. parks and grounds? Yeah. That, that conversation? Yeah. Okay. I believe the plan included FTE growth. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I, well, I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if that's an FY22 thing that we'll be, we'll be hearing about. Yeah. Remember, can you well, remember? I, I think the way we had structured it in the original writing was to think that basically what's most cost effective. There might be situations where contracting might be better, and there might be situations where mm -hmm. hiring an FTE might be more cost effective. You know, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, but then, then there's the sort of the oversight and management yes. piece of it as well. Absolutely. So we, we yeah. I think, I, I think we, you know, we, we recognize that um, additional resources need to be made available, and we we look to your expertise to make a recommendation on what's yeah. best. Yeah. Okay. Did you have uh, anything else to add? Did you want to dive into the electricity yeah. piece? Yeah. If you could pull up that last pivot. slide, Chris, uh, quickly. Um. Uh. So as I uh, had mentioned earlier, currently the town and these. And when I'm saying the town, it's the street lights, it's all of the town buildings, it's the schools, it's the um, pumping station. So the pumping station on Mayflower Lane, the other one that's over on uh, off of Route 16, I don't know what it's actually called, um, which is are actually uh, great consumers of uh, electricity. Um, so that includes all of those those buildings. The town consumes almost five million kilowatts electricity a year. That's a lot. Um, we can enter into uh, a supply agreement with a company called Patriot Energy. Um, you can see currently the town is paying 0 .11572 uh, in supplier charges and those are supplier charges. That's different. There's a distribution charge on your bill and then there's a supplier charge on your bill. The distribution charge is roughly about the same as the supplier charge, give or take. Uh, so, uh, in general, the town is paying roughly 22 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Um, but in any case, we're talking simply the supplier charges. Uh, we can uh, contract with Patriot Energy. Uh, they're an energy broker for a fixed 12-month uh, price of 0 0.98, and I think it's 0 0.9 is blocked on the screen. Um, and that would translate to a monthly savings of $5,572 a month. Uh, or $66,000 per year. Again, that contract could be valid for a year. Really, the only risk of signing that contract is, is if the electricity rate market bottoms out in the next year, you know, we'd be locked into paying this 98 cent or 0 0.098 cents. Um, I think that's quite unlikely, uh, but that would be the risk. I also want to let you know that Matt uh, Zedek, our sustainability coordinator, is working on an electricity aggregation program for the town residents. Um, and that program is through a company called Colonial, uh, and the rate that uh, that's been negotiated to is 0.1 uh, cent, basically 10 cents. Um, and we can decide to, to uh, engage with that. I think Travis actually is working to get some refined numbers maybe if we bring in the yeah, municipal buildings. Yeah, we should buildings. have that soon. Yep. Uh, but if we decide to do that and go with what Matt has come with, I mean, there's still a significant savings. It's $4,400 a month. Um, so, I, I just sharing this with you, we can, um, you know, decide do we want to even enter into this type of agreement for a year or play what, you know, current uh, rates that Eversource is, you know, offering or we just want to align with what uh, Matt is doing um, from the uh, uh, community aggregation program. So we should be able to bring this back relatively short order. We are waiting on information from Colonial. We want to make sure we have more than just the Patriot, obviously. You don't want to just take one. Um, but I think that this is going to be something we want to turn relatively quickly to, to, right. to start recognizing the savings. Have we, have we looked at, um, in this particular process, like one of the things that always comes up and that it came up on the FinCom, and I had a conversation with Matt Zedek about it, actually, is replacing streetlights, too, because we have all the old orange things and it's always like a controversy about how to pay for it because the town would have to be on the hook and yeah it's expensive but I'm just wondering if there's any way we could be even like use this to uh, to dovetail into something like that to try to see if there's a way to, to get some kind of replacement to because it would ultimately save probably save on electricity oh, if we could have oh yeah. the better 
but we need the capital investment. That's sort right. Of yeah, the challenge is is that the fixtures primarily most of them. I think there's nine of them that the town owns, but there's most of them are owned by Eversource. Yeah. So we had to convince them to put in more energy efficient <laughs> light fixtures. Yeah, it becomes that a whole less thing. Money on, you know, right. That's the whole. So if we want to take over them, they'll right. allow us to take over the, of course they would. <laughs> the, the, the fixtures, and of course there's a cost associated with that. Right. So but if we're paying I for know it, Matt's working on right. It. If we're paying for it, I just figured if there's some way that we maybe be able to save some money there because that is a mm -hmm. pretty good substantial line on the uh, the budget. Yeah. That's looking at it. Yeah, excellent. We should have more on that as well. Good. Okay. So I'm not sure if my math is uh, correct, but it looks like you you're underestimating there on. Um, Patriot Energy. Yes. So unless there's some piece yes. to it that's missing, there I get is 88, a piece missing 000. because okay. the Patriot Energy quotes based off of I think 3.9. They couldn't count for all of the electricity. Okay. Uh, so um, I just wanted to share share yeah. that there's a significant right. amount of electricity the town is using. Does the 4.9 include street lighting? Yes. That might be. It. Does um, Colonial Power what we offer to residents the aggregation plan? That's a. It's not one year. It's not 12 months. It's either 18 or thought it was three years. Yeah, I thought it was, th yeah, much more than 12 months. Yes. Is that one of 12 and 24 options? Yeah, 12 and 24, and believe it or not, okay. because there's there are pass-through charges and all these other things, the, the longer term, the price is actually higher. Huh? Okay. It's actually cheaper to go for the 12-month uh, 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 okay. term. If we went with Colonial Power, would we have the option for the energy manager adder that currently we have applied to residents? Residential accounts. I asked about that. I asked okay. Matt about that. I believe he's going to look into oh, that okay. to All see right. if that does That's impact part this. Of what we're waiting on. Yep. Okay. Uh, impact uh, what we could offer the residents by having basically another, you know, four point nine million uh, mm -hmm. kilowatts of use. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thanks. No, I think this is tremendous. I look forward to the report. I'd like to jump on whatever you have for uh, recommendations, Travis. Um, I know where I'm leading. <laughs> That's <laughs> in Patriot Energy Savings. Um, I would also, I think you glossed over quickly, James, but you mentioned something about um, communication tower revenue. Mm -hmm. It's another area that we haven't had sufficient centralized thinking on in terms of maximizing our capabilities of collecting money. Um, I think quickly the town has to realize with the facility manager we're now seeing not just an expense and salary but a savings because the savings come in the form of smarter building management, but also taking care of facilities. And I've been at this for about 20 years now, and I remember back in the late 90s, people talking about this position because we had been investing a lot of money in new buildings, new structures, and there's nothing worse uh, for a taxpayer to, to watch a public asset diminish because of lack of maintenance and proper care. And I know that now that we have a facility manager on, on staff, uh, that's that's not likely to happen. He's demonstrated in the achievements he's got so far that he's keeping an eye on that. So all good from this corner. Um, I'll wait to hear more information on the electricity supply savings, but uh, great report. Very impressive, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you, James. Thank now you. we will move on to the um, town, administrator right town administrator and warrant discussion. Great. And Chris, I think uh, if you could put up the list of articles. Um, so this is uh, this is essentially <coughs> the warrant closed last Friday. So what I have here is sort of everything we were tracking. Uh, there was a couple of questions, uh, and this will still be cleaned up, uh, but only sort of by removing. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a couple of questions uh, the governance committee had a meeting on last Thursday. They had debated uh, putting one article forward. That did not come forward. So there, I, I believe the discussion went that they, they're eyeing a May town meeting uh, and some public hearings between now and then. And then also one that I think I brought to your attention was a potential citizen's petition that also did not come to fruition. So everything in yellow you have um, voted support of and has been sent off with all of its backup documentation to the Finance Committee. I believe their plan because of um, election tomorrow night is to take all of that up on the 10th. So um, if there's any further questions on those, of course, I can take them. But I, I believe this board was comfortable with the ones in yellow. Mm -hmm. So if I'll just sort of knock off the ones below, um, and then we can focus on, on sort of the overarching themes that tie the, the warrant together. The grant writer for primary <laughs> prevention and substance abuse use, this was voted by the Youth and Family Services. I believe it can be incorporated in Article 1. 
either way, um, it was a, an official request for the select board to consider, uh, whether it be its own article or have they? In they, article. they did a presentation in like March. I, th I want to say is yeah. it has anything substantively changed or is it basically the same thing as? What no, I think the need is is just as great, if not greater. Sure. And so I just asked Jackie Weiner um, if if they wanted to consider it on this warrant to sort of reaffirm that. I think you know okay. her understanding, and, and I believe that it, it received support from this board and. And the finance committee, but then was removed uh, as we went through COVID. Yes. Um, but the need they feel is still strong. Road acceptance. This actually goes to um, a discussion that we had last week on Indian Ridge Road South and some other ones um, that were discussed previously. Indian Ridge Road South has been through four iterations of being on town meeting warrant. <laughs> I am still working with Jay Tallerman on that. I'll have him in uh, the office on Wednesday to go through next steps. But I think that we what we may want to do is make sure that we have it on this to make sure that we can go the taking route. Um, it seems like, especially for a few of the road acceptances that were on the July town meeting warrant, um, that we will end up having to go the taking route. And so having the time to go through that process. Um, additionally, as I'll discuss in Article 1, the ability to pay to go through some of those processes uh, will be important. So I want to make sure it's on your radar, but I'm just sort of making sure that I'm following through on the discussion that we had last week. Sales surplus equipment is one that we always have on here. Um, to maintain my numbering system, I've, I've dumped <laughs> it down here. I think if we, if we must have it on the warrant, we can certainly have it down here. I have nothing, no info to put on it. The article to reduce the tax rate as well, I believe, can be handled through Article 1, but I've kept it on here just in case we need to have it. Uh, Where did that originate from? It, was, it has always been an article um, on the past five that I've looked at for special town meetings. Okay. And it's generally Article 5. But I believe that we can actually accomplish it through Article 1, and therefore it may not be necessary this year. Um, and then finally, an easement article that uh, will decide if it is needed as we go forward between now and next Monday. So t starting off at the top, sorry, did you have something? No, just, you're good. So, okay. <laughs> um, so again, everything in yellow has been uh, supported. Everything above that, um, actually, let me go in reverse order. Uh, Community Preservation Fund, the CPC, uh, had their last uh, vote on 1028. I uh, spoke with Frank Chamberlain today, so I have all the information I need from him, I believe. The three article, uh, excuse me, the three items that were put forward by the facilities manager, two for this building, windows and floors upstairs, and then the library facade, which the library director very much appreciated James's effort on, um, were all approved by CPC. Um, I think we discussed previously that the Blair Square Committee had something in front of them that was not approved by the CPC um, at this time. And then one previous uh, item that had um, sort of fallen off their radar in July was put back on. So I should have that full article written up um, based on all the information that they got me before the deadline, which was great and appreciated. Uh, and they wrapped up all their work on the 28th. They're done, right? They won't be meeting again before the 5th, right? Right. Okay. Um, it, it not to vote anything else, certainly uh, they can meet again if they need to discuss anything. But um, And so with that, uh, I would just say Article 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are, are sort of overarching um, items. I would say just to start the discussion because Article 1, the fiscal year 21 budget adjustments was not on my previous iteration of this. Um, DLS has come out with some guidance that um, is going to require we do some cleanup on our budget based on where state aid is going to come in. Um, the town had assumed a 20% reduction in state aid, which did not come to <laughs> fruition. Um, and through the way that DLS is asking cities and towns to handle that, it will require that we do some cleanup of the budget that was approved July 20th. Um, and I can get into the details of that um, to put in place essentially the 1% budget that had been established before COVID and before the assumption that state aid would be reduced included um, some job classification information that um, would affect non-union personnel. So to correct that within Article 1 requires Article 2. There is some debate between myself and the finance staff of which of those must go first. I like this order, but uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still going back and forth on that. Um, and then so Article 3 is to put money into the stabilization fund. That was also a substantial cut that happened related to the um, reduction in the assumption of state aid, as well as money into the capital expenditure fund. How much was taken out of stabilization? Do you remember? Was it six? So 400000 was used to... Um, to make the budget work, 
um, but also that was re reducing the amount that was that would generally be appropriated into stabilization. So 400,000 was used to smooth the budget, um, but no money was put in at that time. And so all of these things obviously are, are sort of the, the flow of dollars in and out. Um, we also now have fr our free cash number certified. Um, thank you to uh, Sharon and Mary for that. Um, and we are sort of on pace. I think I went over the schedule last week with you on how this could work, provided we have a December 5th town meeting that we would open our tax rate hearing potentially as early as November 30th, have our town meeting over the weekend, then have another uh, select board meeting at closing the hearing um, on December 7th, get all of that information to DLS and have the bills out in time for Christmas. Um, and so we're on a tight schedule this year, but this is where we are. So let me just go over some of the highlights. Um, and uh, I know I had sent this information to you previously. So, um, so Article 1 um, to correct some of the issues that we had uh, would have right now I have a draft, um, a raise and appropriate of $564,800. Uh, in Article 1. Article 2 is simply to reflect um, a very small amount of that 564000 that would impact um, non-union personnel. Article 3, the stabilization fund, would um, put in the $400,000 that was cut out of the budget um, into stabilization and also move the overlay that was released by the assessors um, for a total of $884,000 moving into the general stabilization fund. Um, the capital expenditure fund um, is is going to be offsetting for the most part what we'll discuss in Article 5, the capital budget, which is what I'd like to get into, um, but essentially keeping the balance of the CapEx fund where it is while offsetting the capital expenditures that um, are proposed here um, that I also have another slide to go into, but if there's any questions on those and sort of how they tie together. Any questions, Ben? Uh, not to this point, no. Tina, you good? Yes. Keep going. Okay, Chris, could I get the uh, next PowerPoint, please? So these have been discussed. I know I've, I've sort of talked high level with this board about them, although you know there's a lot of moving parts, so uh, I will go back into them. I've also discussed these with the Capital Subcommittee that James mentioned before and Ben sits on. Um, and I will, I believe their meeting, we'll have that meeting uh, Thursday, this Thursday yeah. at 6.30 as well to go through this now that the list has sort of um, come to fruition. So the last two here are the schools. This is the information that I wanted to make sure you saw. Obviously, we're on a little bit of a different timeline. I did get this information from Keith Bidet. As I note, um, these have not yet been voted by the school committee, but I just wanted you to sort of understand the full scope of what could be in before making any decisions. The Chromebooks, and I don't want to speak for Keith because uh, this was a number that I sort of made sure we had, but I don't have all of the backup on, but essentially it would be, the idea would be it is very difficult for us to order Chromebooks at the moment, whereas every school district in, in, it, in the country is looking for Chromebooks, that it is important to pre-order these, and therefore that would be the thinking if it were to be a request on this town meeting warrant. Um, and so it makes sense to have it here potentially, uh, but we'll discuss that again on Thursday and I'll, I can come back to you next week uh, if you have any uh, uncomfort level with that. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Why wouldn't we be considering the, co uh, the Chromebooks against the CARES Act? So it would be, and, and I think Chromebooks were discussed with the CARES Act before I came into town. Uh, I remember catching up on some meetings and Chief Cassidy can, can probably um, recollect better than I can, but some of these things are just our our normal upkeep of Chromebooks, um, replacing and and sort of and that and and some of them are related to making sure that we are prepared for um, the possibility of you know fully remote learning. I would say that this would be on our normal um, capital um, planning uh, of of replacing. So you're so. saying that basically. The idea is that it might not be CARES eligible because it was something that we were anticipated. It wasn't an unanticipated expense. That, I mean, would, be, could, yeah, yeah. that would be the theory. And could, uh, could it be discussed in, in CARES? I think we could certainly have that conversation. Is it, it, would it be something, too, because if we're ordering them at this time, would the assumption be, I mean, obviously you're not speaking for Keith, but is the assumption, though, that it would not be on a May town meeting, that we're basically ordering them now instead of ordering them in May? 
that this would be yeah uh, okay. essentially understanding that as we approach let's May let's put this on the agenda yeah. for Thursday okay with the superintendent Thursday morning sure just so those two I just wanted to give you the full scope because I don't want you to just look at at the town side and not understanding the school component so that sure. that is I believe you know sort of quote unquote a worst case scenario of what we may be looking at just to, to understand scope so going from the top these are the items that have been sort of um, existing on here for quite a while I have three in yellow that that could sort of be discussed in terms of if if this is the right time or if they should be removed um, so the first one is a facilities manager within that position was always assumed and actually is written in the agreement that 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 individual has a town owned vehicle that was cut due to COVID um, obviously the that has lead us led us hmm. to pivot into paying it, him for it mileage it, it wasn't cut you're gonna see some items here that were deferred deferred yeah we yep. were just taking up you know urgent issues only in July absolutely and on the page that it's on it, it does refer to deferring so I apologize so that is a vehicle the the quote that I have in there um, for you the vehicle um, complies with our green communities um, outline of, of the vehicles that we would purchase uh, again 1750 Washington the safety railings this is again a deferral it was discussed um, and then removed from um, the amount that was approved at town meeting this ten thousand dollars if you look to the left of the 1750 Washington building there are stairs that go down to the lower lot and there are um, orange essential cones blocking it off because the railings are not safe people still walk up and down the sides of them to get around them and at this point it's more of a liability and just needs to be fixed I think it's it's for the best uh, and um, will improve that building the town hall septic we can continue to discuss right now we have a few different um, conceptual understandings of, of how this can happen I think it's a priority to make that happen for this building uh, upstairs is probably not gonna be accessible to the public for rental until we've we've um, handled that uh, we have a few options in the layout that we'll continue to discuss but we believe that hundred fifty thousand dollars is the maximum um, cost of that project that would be um, the costlier of, of the options that we can discuss um, which would involve pumping up the back uh, into land that we currently own the next two um, are highway vehicles um, the uh, highway superintendent through uh, the DPW director brought me his priority request which is the trackless mower that is a machine that impacts multiple departments including the rec department I asked him you know sort of looking at the list of the fleet schedule of, of highway could you please give me you know what would be your next priority and that is the 55,000 if we had to make a cut that would be one of the potential ones that I have down below as an option um, I think based on the fleet schedule which I've included in your packet as well uh, it makes sense to do more than one vehicle uh, in this cycle but at the same point understanding that we may you know may need to look at the, the bottom line that that would be a potential cut the trackless mower being the number one priority uh, number six the police vehicles this is staying on track with our replacement um, cycle I have added in here after speaking with Chief Stone um, an escalator the the number had been stagnant from the cost of these vehicles and the um, well, I don't want to run into a position where we don't get a vehicle that that is outfitted the way that we need because we were you know um, too exact on the dollar this sort of this assumes that the market will increase for these vehicles and the cost to outfit these vehicles uh, James Keese mentioned earlier the heating system at, at HPD I think at this point we are prepared to remove this um, the Delta would have been eighteen thousand one hundred dollars assuming the green communities amount that had been put forward for this um, the ROI on the boiler um, is, is just not gonna make sense for us it's unfortunate to have to turn around turn away green communities money uh, and I don't want to do that but I think that we've sort of done our due diligence to see that this is not something that um, spending eighteen thousand one hundred dollars on is in the best interest of the town at this time and it's not a, a situation where it's like on its last legs it's just more it's basically we're look exploring it as a potential uh, cost savings with uh, uh, converting it to natural gas am I remembering that correctly so it's natural gas now it would be increasing the efficiency increasing of the efficiency so it's and basically so it's just creating it's getting a better a better boiler as opposed to necessarily replacing something that's at the end of life right and so from a from an ROI on the energy perspective which is why the green communities grant did not do the full boat right. 
is that the ROI is, is over 20 years. When you factor in the fact that it's our boiler and we're going to end up maintaining it towards the end of its useful life, we could probably make a case that the ROI is then down more in the 10 years. But even then, you're still probably looking for this type of investment of ROI you'd want to see in the five to eight years, and it's just not going to make sense at this time. Got it. The next one, um, Chief Cassidy could speak to either of these, but I will just sort of highlight we are looking, we are still waiting for information, which we believe the last update should be by the 12th of November on the potential supplemental appropriation for the public safety radio interoperability. This would be to reinforce the poles that they will be on. The Mellon Street Tower. The Mellon Street Tower. $30,000 we feel is. Um, the highest amount and would be pared down if anything. Um, but we will have more information on that at this time. But to make sure that we can um, finalize that project, it's important that that would be in here. This has been discussed um, with the Capital Subcommittee, but not um, fully discussed at this time because the final information and quote is not in hand. The this next one is sort of a late addition and why I also have it as an option to remove potentially if, if that's your choice. Um, it's is one that has been discussed previously though uh, and was removed when potentially warranted more further discussion and, and probably if it is, it is not rem if it is not held on here tonight would probably warrant future discussion as well. This is for cameras along the Washington Street corridor at traffic lights. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would let Chief Cassidy speak to it, but essentially um, my thought here, if it were to be removed, it would probably want to come back through a TAC request um, if, if that committee saw the value in it. But I think because it's sort of new, if you would like to sort of give the, the elevator speech on it, um, I'll also be discussing it on Thursday with the Finance Committee, oh, excuse me, the Capital Subcommittee. So just to clarify, this is not... Um, cameras for red light enforcement. This is cameras for real-time monitoring by public safety uh, to be able to observe congestion, be able to uh, observe gridlock, uh, be able to observe erratic operation, uh, and as has been the case a few times, to be able to go back uh, and look at footage to see a vehicle that is wanted in connection with an investigation would be very helpful from an investigative standpoint. We had a recent pedestrian uh, injured that it would have been very helpful if we had cameras at Washington and Woodland or Washington and Concord to have been able to scroll back to a few minutes before the crash to get uh, better information on the vehicle that was involved. And so I think we can certainly have further discussion. As I said, I haven't had the opportunity to discuss this with the Capital Subcommittee at, the, at this time. Um, but it is not it is not a new one, which is why I felt comfortable adding it to the list now for discussion. It has been discussed in the past, and again, um, if you know if we feel like there isn't capacity at this time, I think I would probably you know anticipate it seeing it come back through attack request. I think every time we have an incident like the one Chief Cassidy just described, we always all all sort of realize this is something that would really be beneficial to the town to have, um, and then it sort of falls off our radar, but. Um, you know, it, it's nice to make sure that we're, we're considering these things. Um, and at this time, in my opinion, I think we do have the capacity for it. Um, but we can get back to that once I get through the, the full list. So the next one, the fire, specifically the replacement of air packs and bottles. Also, Chief Cassidy was waiting to hear back on a grant. We have not received that in this round, but this is a substantial need. Um, and these uh, currently are sort of past, past the date in which they can be um, Managed, no, sustained, serviced. serviced. There you go. Um, so I think at this point we, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that we didn't get the grant to offset partially this cost, but um, I think the need is, is certainly there. Uh, the number 11, the ambulance pagers, this, this couples with last year's request for the fire pagers and replaces um, all units <laughs> between those two departments. Getting into um, two facilities lines, this I think I discussed previously with this board, I know I've discussed it with the Finance Committee and the Capital Subcommittee, is um, because of, I think, some of the discussions that we've had where the facilities budget has not been able to do a lot of the maintenance over the years, we get into situations where we need to do more substantial projects 
and I would put both of these in that category. One is library interior carpeting, paintings, and plaster, painting and plaster, and the senior center interior painting and plaster uh, and ceiling tiles. And so those two combined are about $105,000, which even when we're looking potentially at building up a facilities budget would probably not be in the 22 budget, right? They still need to be done in this cycle. But the idea behind building up a facilities budget in the future would be that hopefully we could avoid these types of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so both of these I have is coming from free cash. Uh, and I've spoke with, with both the library director and the senior center director just to confirm that they are very much in favor of these. Appreciate James' um, work uh, on these and um, think that they're very uh, substantial. So all of these combined for 1.35, I have a few options for reducing that down to 1.18. I think this is very much in line with, with past um, capital articles that you've seen at, at special town meeting. Um, I'm, I'm personally, you know, comfortable with, with, you know, any of these projects, although, you know, we could certainly look to prioritize it if that was something the select board wanted. Um, and again, I'll, I'll have more clarity hopefully soon from the schools. Questions, Mr. Sparrow? Um, so uh, thank you for this information. I think this is great. It's nice to have this like all in one space and kind of having a lot of the questions answered like useful life and things like that. Um, one question I have here is about the uh, the Silverado for the highway department. Uh, I know they have a few vehicles. Um, could do you have um, I probably could go look it up too, but but I was wondering if maybe you have it. Um, the l how many of the vehicles they have and if are they reasonably new or I, I, I the reason I'm asking is I just don't want to necessarily if we do consider moving it off of uh, this particular warrant that are we not like stacking up where now we suddenly have like two or three that we have to replace as opposed to just uh, the one at this time right and so that that was my fear honestly when you know I I, I like when department heads are, are looking you know what's the most what's the least we can do we understand it's a difficult time and so bringing one vehicle which sure. was the trackless mower was appreciated but my thought was sort of what is what is number two on your list because I don't want to get into that situation either. Right. So included in what I most recently sent you is the fleet schedule, including the Chevy Silverados. This one in question is the 2008. Uh, it's the S3 vehicle number within their fleet schedule, and um, is is the oldest of the um, Chevy dump trucks. Uh, the rest of them of the Chevy series dump trucks, uh, excuse me, and, and pickup trucks are all. Um, 2017 it looks like and later so okay, okay. Um, uh, of the Chevys in the fleet that you've seen around this is the one that we're looking at is the oldest at 2008 um, and then I mean that it's not always just yeah, a year that we're looking at it's obviously based on on condition it's based on mileage on the vehicle but um, this is the number two priority um, based on this fleet schedule okay yeah I mean I, I like being able to I, I think it's important to have a schedule and if we decide to move it then we make that we, and then we move it, but at least we should be aware of when things should be replaced and have a schedule to do so. So we're not getting ourselves again to we're talking about maintenance of our buildings. We should be doing the same thing with our, our, our fleet too. We don't want to necessarily have a, a, a vehicle that we're paying exorbitant amounts because we have to constantly repair it. So, okay. Yeah, I see it now. I, I, I apologize. I, I missed the, uh, the, the extra pages. So uh, that was my, my good. question. I'm good. Tina. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the request for the public safety cameras on traffic signals, I could go either way on this one. It makes I, I hear what you're saying about there's room in this warrant for it to appear now. Um, I could also see the benefit of it going to the traffic advisory committee in that there are residents who sit on that committee and I would imagine, uh, I don't want to speculate, but I would imagine there may be debate at, at town meeting as to how we feel as a community about cameras, and I'm not weighing in one side or the other on that, but it might vet the, those kinds of questions if it went before the Traffic Advisory Committee and you have a panel of residents as well as public safety officials who are reviewing it and then making the, the request um, to the select board. So I, I really could go either way on that one, but I do see a benefit to, you know, if, if the decision were made for it to go before the Traffic Advisory Committee, I think that's one benefit. You would have residents on that committee reviewing this and could probably uh, speak to uh, any concerns over, you know, what we've heard in the past, which is your mounting cameras where you had to clarify that they're not red light cameras, you know, they're not going to be capturing um, information in that way. So I wanted to add that. And then Chief... Sorry, could I just yeah. add one thing to oh, that sure. one, particularly yeah. because I, I pick on Chief Cassidy because he's sitting in the room, Always. but Chief Stone um, is also in agreement of the need for these and that they came, it came from both of them. Yeah, right, right. Um, okay. And then uh, in terms of 
the CARES Act request, oh, sorry, the comment about the schools, technology, and CARES Act. On the CARES Act spreadsheet, we have carried, week after week when it's presented, we have carried the original June 11th request that was 4, uh, 497,790. I thought that in there was a, another technology request from the schools. I'm, I'm just going through my notes on that one. Do you recall what the schools requested initially, so June 11th? What was their technology request? So that was largely the remote uh, telework capacity, which is different from Chromebooks, which are issued to students. Okay, all right. So we're drawing a distinction here. But I, it's thought not we just bought, I thought we bought Chromebooks also. I, I'm, I mean, I'm trying to find the notes. There's a $21,000 request within that CARES Act. Um, there was discussion. There was a large amount, and I'm trying to remember it off the top of my head because I saw it three thousand at yes. that yeah. initial period of time that Tina's talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I let uh -huh. me bring back more information on this again. I just got this number. Right. Um, and Keith will be on the capital subcommittee. We can ask. We Thursday. can ask him those questions on and Thursday. Thursday as well. Um, when you're and and I again I, I appreciate you know Keith getting me the number because I wanted to make sure that you had the sort of <coughs> the total mm -hmm. scope. Um, so I don't want to speak for him either. Um, yeah. Travis, just as a reminder, our capital request policy also dictates that the elected boards come before us to make the request. Okay. So certainly before we move too, further along, too much further along as these things become real, would mind hearing from uh, schools or any other, other board that uh, makes a request for capital product. You all set, Tina? I am. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of things for you, Travis. Again, nice job. I like the way it's presented. Um, I asked the question before, and I'm not sure I got a clear answer, but if we're going to make the capital improvement plan work, it has to be something we reference. I'm not clear, looking at that list, how it crosswalks to the CIP. CIP that I'm looking at is a little old. I think, I think Ben gave it to me in July of 2019. Um, we happen to have the chief here before <laughs> us. Um, I'm going to list off a bunch of things, chief, and you're probably going to laugh and say, oh, we already did those things, but these were then put in the FY21 capital silo. Uh, I don't know that any of them are on this list right now. Some of them may have already been dealt with, but at the time, you ready, Chief? Yes, sir. Yes. Upgrade pavement at Central Fire Station? Not done. Replace the HVAC system? Not done. Replace the air handlers? Not done. Replace the phone system? Not done. Uh, install security cameras at Central Fire? Partially done. Install fire systems at Central Fire? Not done. Stand by. Replace extraction equipment. Not done. Replace cascade system. Not done. Oh, and actually, so let me, let me rephrase. Extraction has been done. And finally, the replace structural firefighting gear. Has been done. Okay, so there's a mixed mix bag of product, Travis, that seems to be done. Others that from that CIP round aren't. How are we bridging those two sure. plans? So I've updated what Ben would have sent you in 2019, and we've been going through that with the capital subcommittee, and I can sort of bring that spreadsheet to you and, and you know show where it lives and, and where we are with it. Where I am right now is everything pre-dude solutions, right? So anything facilities related, we're still waiting to update the entire capital plan based on the output from that. So based on talking with Chief Cassidy uh, and all of the department heads on where their lists stood, we have a list now that's sort of updated for FY21 and beyond, looking at also what was accomplished this past July and what we're looking at on this. Anything, you know, so for example, the priority for Chief Cassidy in, in this list was the ambulance pagers and the air packs and bottles, the cascade system, as Chief Cassidy highlighted, was the one that could probably be pushed so as it was as these costs begin to compound. Um, and so those were discussions that I had with each department head as, as you're, I'm using that example, obviously. Sorry, Chief, I continue to pick on you, but, but he picked on you first. Um, <laughs> and so those conversations were going place. Through some of the ones that you mentioned in terms of, um, it, that were at the top of the list that you that you read were facilities. The other conversation that I had with Chief Cassidy is that most of those conversations, um, unless we it was sort of a ha uh, a safety issue or those types of things, again we're waiting for the to prioritize with the dude solution. So, 
the way I approached it was to take the list that had been created that Ben was holding on to from the Collin Center evaluation, update it based on department head feedback, my sort of discussing with department heads on, on most pressing needs, have it in a position where now it can be impacted by the dude solutions. And then through that, we'll, we should have what I feel what the town can begin to look at as here is our five year capital plan. Mm -hmm. And then also obviously beyond that because five years comes up real quick. Um, and so that's where I am at the moment. I can share that with you. I've been working through it and answering questions with the capital subcommittee, but I you, would not mind. I don't want to belabor the point. You, you, you've answered my question, which is you are finding a way to bridge that plan with these needs. Yes. That's that's really all I okay. want to spend a lot of time on talking about tonight. The content of what gets into the plan, however, is a different topic, different conversation we can have another time. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, can I just take please. that opportunity? Then the other thing that I've developed and within your backup, you sort of have the beginning stages of it, which is a capital request form, a five year mm -hmm. capital request form, right? And so ideally, as we approach the FY22 season, even though I know capital and budget has sort of been um, different cycles in this town, generally speaking, I would couple the two. I would distribute the capital request form to the same people that have budget requests and, and have, you know, that includes committees that don't have mm -hmm. a budget necessarily, but mm -hmm. may have a capital request, right? A, a Blair Square committee, for example, in the future uh, type of a project where you give people the opportunity to identify future capital needs so that they get on my radar if they're not already. Um, and so having that form and going forward is, is also one of the next steps to make right. sure that all the information gets to me. We, uh, earlier tonight, we were talking with James about how much he's done in just under eight months. Um, you're even more of a rookie. You've only got a few few months. So forgive me for what I'm about to say, but I think you may understand where I'm going. With respect to our budget cycle, whether it's operating budget and here in the capital budget cycle, I'd strongly encourage you in the next year or so to start exploring a centralized budget tool uh, that's possibly cloud-based that brings in all of these budget requests for both operating and capital into one cloud-based process that can be used to source information into the various areas for management. Um, I, I don't want to speak for Ben, but for years he was the custodian of a spreadsheet. We shouldn't be doing that in 2020. That should be a, a commonly used resource that the town manager, the town administrator handles. Uh, but I do think there's some room for uh, exploring uh, better tools for budgeting, and I just wanted to point that out. I'm sure you've been thinking about that. I'll bet some of the communities worked in had tools like that. I work with a tool like that. It's much easier to uh, create that kind of a uh, document with those kind of tools these days than, um, than what the ones we have right now. So that's just uh, food for thought um, down the road. Uh, any other questions on the capital items that uh, the town administrator has brought to us? Do you have anything else you want to share tonight about these warrant articles? No, so I think we can, uh, at this point, you know, all of the information is in front of you. I think we take one vote, if possible, if, if you're in this position next Monday night, um, and then we can start to finalize the warrant document. As I said, I have Jay Tallerman on Wednesday to sort of go through any language, um, make sure that all of that is tied up so that you can feel comfortable with the warrant next Monday. Um, if we don't stay on that schedule, it's just, a, it's just gonna be an issue of document production, but I think that's the goal. But if it that doesn't hit that, you don't have to feel tied to that timeline either. Great. And the number of articles seems in the right scale for a special, um, especially under these circumstances. Um, nothing too outside the bounds. 20 is a good number. Could be less, right? Could be less. <coughs> and um, some of them, especially, you know, given I if there's support across all boards and committees, potentially looking at, you know, bundling, and some of them are not, you know, s substantial discussion points. Great. All right. We'll look forward to seeing that next week. Excellent. All right, let's bounce back here. And the finance committee's not <coughs> meeting this week, right? Because of the election. Exactly. They're on for next yeah. week. They'll be meeting on the tenth, so we'll have next Monday. Um, and then again, if you're ready, we could put it the whole warrant forward. If not, um, we'll just have to okay. juggle the schedule a little. All right. So moving on to at this point, board business. Uh, the first item is a MassDOT briefing update. Do um, you want me to touch this first and you can fill in some blanks on next steps? 
Um, this is related to last Thursday's meeting with MassDOT in the field? Sure, so just high level, we, a site visit is allowed, uh, um, a site visit with the select board members is allowed under open meeting law and what we're doing here is sort of reporting back on that. Mm -hmm. Obviously no discussion outside of public meeting took place. It was more um, to have a discussion with MassDOT on some of the issues that the town is facing that we've discussed previously and, and this is your opportunity to sort of report back to the town. So uh, this past August, we mentioned to some stakeholders in L Lowland Industrial Park on a Zoom call that we were going to engage MassDOT on a series of um, uh, attempts to uh, explore commercial vehicle exclusions. Uh, it led to a wider scope. And so in September, we had MassDOT out to review the streets and the surrounding areas of Lowland, as well as certain highway projects that we are trying to get some prioritization on. And finally, um, uh, the South Street uh, area. That meeting um, was preliminary. Uh, and it was to be followed by a meeting with uh, legislative leaders to understand the priorities and urgencies uh, that are expressed to us by residents for those, uh, I keep calling them bookend projects. So on Thursday in the, in the rain, uh, <laughs> we all got in our car caravan and made our way around uh, town starting in Lowland and the surrounding areas, uh, following up Route 16, ultimately to South Street. Um, I believe we're in the field for a couple of hours. Um, we had a productive afternoon with uh, mm -hmm. two, no, actually three engineers from MassDOT um, who were very engaged. One was a return visitor. They understand our priorities quite clearly. They were giving us some good feedback on vehicle counts, uh, asking questions of um, the circumstances in the, in the surrounding areas uh, regarding commercial traffic. Um, most importantly, I think on the South Street side, we had um, the full support of the Medway Town Manager who met us at the line with two of his police officers. Um, I think he made a very um, uh, blunt impression on the MassDOT stakeholders. He, uh, he flat out said that uh, Medway fully supports an extension, excuse me, an exclusion on the extension of um, South Street uh, that becomes Clark and Medway and to receive any um, commercial vehicle traffic uh, from Route 109 into Medway up towards Route 126 and then thus onward. Um, I felt very positive following the meeting. I thought we had made all the right um, connections uh, with MassDOT. Now the task falls to us to collaborate with them. Um, I know you're working with one engineer, Lori, to produce some information immediately on Woodland and some other areas. So we did briefly talk about some timelines. Uh, the timelines were understandably bureaucratic uh, timelines measured in months. Um, not many, just a couple, I think, before we could possibly see some favorable outcomes associated with our requests. Um, we also briefly talked about, I guess you could call it walking around numbers, how much it's going to cost to do things. Uh, certainly, Lowland Industrial Park um, presents a, a, a considerable uh, project um, at Whitney and uh, Route 16 that intersection will likely have to be redesigned, signalized, and first studied, and then um, signalized uh, for it to be effective. Uh, we'll be looking at a lot of money to do that, and so we've got to start exploring some alternatives for funding that. Um, but overall, I consider both meetings to be very positive. Um, the good news is we were able to bring our partners from MassDOT out in very short time frame, within about a month or so, for them to visit it. Um, I want to compliment Rep. Teichema for joining us, um, as well as uh, Dennis Giambetti from Senator Spilka's office, who both joined us in the rain, stayed with us. Um, it was very good to have them on hand. They heard everything firsthand, contributed their support for our projects, and overall, I think it was a great day, despite the weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my colleagues were with me. Did you want to add anything to that, Tina or Ben? Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, I know I'm not as uh, deeply involved as you both are, um, but it was good for me to be able to hear some of the, uh, some things and see some things on the ground, especially like, we, you know, sitting on South Street, one of the residents came by and she said, first of all, thanked us for what we were doing, but she also mentioned, you know, I almost got driven off the road by one of those big trucks that just went by. And it was pretty obvious that those, the road is inadequate to handle some of the traffic that is, uh, uh, placed upon it and um, you know I, I hope we're able to find some solutions with MassDOT and if not we'll have to explore other options but I think uh, we uh, doing nothing is no longer an option in that in, in, in these cases and uh, we've already taken some steps on Mullen Street and I'm I, I'm keen I, I really want to see what about South Street the only other thing I want to add is just that uh, 
we, uh, <coughs> you know, they mentioned it, uh, the MassDOT folks mentioned it, but I think we need to just make sure we're kind of uh, casting the net wide and looking at um, other, uh, other sort of almost unintended consequences of some of the things that happen. Uh, we saw that with the, uh, the Mudville signaliza the, the signalization of uh, downtown, and then suddenly Mudville became the, uh, uh, the, the, the cut between to get around uh, some of those signals and that, that we had to take action to, uh, to, to work on that, as I'm sure uh, Ms. Hine is intimately aware of. Um, Mr. Cronin is <laughs> 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 um, But, uh, but I, I just want to make sure that we're, we're looking at other things and making sure that if we fix one street, we're not playing whack-a-mole to try to do other. So we're really trying to make sure that we're keeping our eyes open and looking at other things and trying to keep our eyes uh, peeled to say, you know, if we, if we put an exclusion here, does that cause something to pop up there? And is this, you know, particular intersection adequate to handle you know, I if uh, new traffic is coming down it, you know, things like that. So um, that's all I really have to say. So, you know, thanks for, uh, you know, You know, it's funny, it the up. engineers use whack-a-mole terms several <laughs> times that day. <laughs> very appropriate. It's a, techni it's a technical it really term. It really flies, right? It's a technical <laughs> term. So I, I, I thank you uh, for setting it up and to working on uh, bringing the masked up folks in. And uh, it was a good uh, educational experience for me. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully we can find some solutions in the, in the I use the bureaucratic near future. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Tina. Uh, I mean, the conditions were tough, no doubt about <laughs> it. At times, the rain and the masks uh, made it very difficult to speak or be heard. To that end, I, I kind of want to uh, come back to a, a point that I did not have the opportunity, given those conditions, to really make hmm. as strong as I, as I would have wanted to um, when we were doing the walkthrough. We did hear from MassDOT that day they confirmed that the lowland truck exclusion the 7 p.m to 7 a.m is official it's been accepted and, and therefore enforceable um, and so i kind of wanted to come back to that because we again did not have the opportunity to, to get into that detail last week it is i believe in the lowland industrial park forum the memo that was written after that forum um, i truly support efforts to keep the industrial truck traffic on state numbered routes i think that the town manager from medway spoke to some of the problems that they're seeing in medway he mentioned a truck that had gone off a local road and laid in a ditch and was causing pollution problems not that alone also uh, congestion and, and safety and all that um, so i absolutely support keeping the industrial truck traffic on state numbered route, routes the geometry the infrastructure the potential state and federal funding um, improvements those are in place on state numbered routes they are not in place um, to anywhere near the same extent on our local roads um, i know that shifting industrial truck traffic may have the um, overall detriment of of increasing volume and counts on those state numbered routes but i think that that is far outweighed by the benefit uh, and also congestion on those state numbered routes i i know that that is a downside if we put all roads back all trucks it's gotta back. go somewhere right well right so because what's that what's that in balance with that is the the safety the noise problems the zoning the design of our local roads i, I think those are the two things that we're balancing here so i, I really want to come back to that lowland truck exclusion that's in place currently from 7 p.m to 7 a.m and work if we need to do more work here with the board with you travis or come back to dot and, and put that forward a little bit more strongly but look to see that as a possible 24-hour exclusion because what we did not do in terms of site visits uh, on our walkthrough was bullard central fisk but what we know to be a significant issue is the volume of truck traffic on bullard central and fisk and so that was one thing and i'm sorry to be doing it tonight you know without any heads up before but i you know i'm thinking about tonight knowing we're going to give this update to the community i really just wanted to double down on um, revisiting the truck exclusion on the other end of lowland that is currently 7 p.m to 7 a.m look to possibly extend that to 24 hours um, so i wanted to put that out there Sure. And so just to reiterate a couple other things that yeah. obviously we didn't discuss tonight because the board has already supported, um, but articles that we have to get um, truck counts on streets, we're currently pursuing Woodland because we have truck counts. Uh, and as the chair mentioned, I'm in discussions with MassDOT um, on those counts and, and any other documentation that they requested at the site visit, including sort of the safe routes to schools components and some of the, the other data that we have to support that claim. I don't know where we are um, in terms of if we would have the data currently okay. to increase. Or, so there's three uh, uh, truck exclusions that we could pursue. Um, 
they all have different warrants to pursue those. Um, the 5% uh, heavy commercial vehicle truck um, traffic is the one that, that gives you the exclusion um, for the 24-7. The 12-hour the, this, the exclusion is a, is a different warrant level, which is, is easier to achieve, and I believe that's probably why the town pursued that when it did. So to include, to increase that, I think would still require many of the warrant articles that we previously discussed to give us the tools to pursue that through the data collection to, to provide to MassDOT. Um, so I had been thinking of new exclusions. I had not been thinking of increasing a, a current exclusion, but that's well, certainly glad something I brought it up tonight. we can <laughs> pursue, yeah. Uh, and, and I think for residents in that area, they should know that we had it confirmed that it's enforceable. DOT recognizes the truck exclusion at 7 a.m. to 7, excuse me, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I know we'd had some complaints from residents, some concerns that they were seeing truck traffic before 7 a.m. coming down Lowland off of Central and Norfolk. So if that message can get to the police uh, or resident, you know, if residents want to reach out to the police, we, we know that that is something, again, that's enforceable. That was a small positive among, among others, but one that I picked up on. Mm -hmm. that's it. Yes, thank you. All right. So I think that carries us through the update. Um, our next step is to work internally with MassDOT to, towards the progression of our overall plan. And uh, I would expect that sometime after town meeting, we'll be hearing more about where that's trending. Is that safe to say? Yes. But all right, let's move on. Uh, Mr. Sparrow, if you would be so kind as to make a motion to approve the select board meeting minutes for October 5th and 19th. My pleasure. Uh, I will make a motion to approve the select board meeting minutes for October 5th 2020 and October 19th, 2020, as uh, written. I'll second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 That carries. Before I forget, are you, uh, don't, didn't you say you were having some time off in November? Time out? Yep, 19th through the 2018. Okay. The back end of the month, right. Okay. I'll miss one. one okay, day. that's good. All right. Uh, next is an appointment of Donna Walsh as the animal control officer for a one year term. Um, well, I don't have any objection to bring this forward. I will ask the administrator, why is this coming in now, and why didn't this come in when all the other appointments went through earlier this year? I believe this would just be based on her date, but I can confirm that. Okay. In any event, I'll take a motion to appoint Ms. Donna Walsh, the animal control officer, for a one-year term. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye that carries. Uh, we have a request to disband the town administrator's screening committee. Uh, this is because we hired a town administrator. He's kind of working out, so <laughs> I think at this point we feel comfortable. I'll entertain a motion to expand uh, and thank uh, the screening committee for all their work um, uh, this past spring for a new town administrator. Do I have a motion? Uh, I'll make that motion uh, with the comments of thank you to the, uh, the uh, members, uh, James Arena DeRosa, Thomas Cady, uh, Stacy Raffi, Mary Greendale, Robert Malone, Scott McKechnie and Barbara Gardner. Okay, I have a motion. Tina, do you have a second? second? Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. That carries. Uh, other business, Mr. Sparrow. Uh, the only comments I'll have, I mean, this might be something for later. Um, I sent out a couple weeks ago um, a review of the previous quarter's uh, uh, actions from the select board, and mm -hmm. I just uh, I wanted to. Uh, solicit any feedback. I mean, it's, it, it's, I'm just asking in, in other business that, you know, I'm not sure if it should be an art, uh, um, a, um, uh, a part of our agenda. I don't necessarily think it should be that, but at least uh, if there's any edits or additions or changes, um, I'd like to hear that feedback so we can get that published uh, sooner. Got it. I had some feedback. I was talking to Travis about it. I think it's just something that we have to kind of wrap up. So yes, I, I, I'd like that. I'd like to wrap it up so we can get it out there. Yeah, I did provide feedback then. Okay. To, to Travis. Okay. So. okay. I will circle that up. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. I just wanted to bring it up. Tina or anything? Oh, was that it? Um, uh, hold on. Let me check my notes. I believe that is it. Yep. That's all I got. Tina? Uh, two things about the rail trail. So last week we had discussion here with the select board that we are going to look to send out letters uh, for residences that are encroaching on the trail. Um, in between last week and this, this week's meeting, um, there was a report from a resident who was walking on the trail, somebody dumping over the side of the trail and rocks coming down onto the trail. So um, I guess this is just a public service announcement at this point in time. That's deeply concerning. Um, people need to understand that there's a 30-foot right-of-way for the rail trail and their own 
backyard debris, their own um, materials and, and equipment cannot be stored and encroach upon that 30 foot um, right of way. So um, really want residents who abut the rail trail to be mindful of that. We cannot have material falling onto the rail trail when people are walking along it or, or where the grade of your backyard is higher than the trail down onto those people on the trail. That's just really concerning. Uh, and then also in terms of the trail, I would inc let residents know that um, we are looking for solutions to trash in Blair Square. We know that it's an issue and we are exploring different options to have a more permanent and sustainable solution. It may take a little bit of time for us to figure it out, but we are actively working to find a solution for that. So that's all. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the only comment I have is one word, please, uh, two, please vote. <laughs> um, I will at this point uh, entertain a motion to enter into executive session this evening. Uh, reason number six, uh, to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. I will remind people we will not be returning uh, to our regular session. So at this point, I'll entertain the motion to enter executive session. And upon successful uh, such motion, um, I wish everybody a very uh, peaceful evening tomorrow. Uh, get out and vote. Uh, enjoy the week ahead. And if I could have a motion yep. to uh, enter executive session. Make the motion to enter executive session for the purposes of discussing a lease purchase or the last one you said there. Exchange lease or value of uh, real you. property. Do you have a second? Second. All those in favor by t uh, polling? Yes. Mr. Sparrow, aye. aye. Tina Hine, aye. John Cronin, aye. That is it. We will be entering executive session. Good night, Hollison. We'll see you next week.